Once upon a time, in a fairy world, a boy was born. He was beautiful, his hair was golden in color, and his big clear eyes were blue. Since he was a little boy, he looked at everything around him with a scrutinizing gaze. There were candles everywhere, instead of electricity, which proved to the little boy that he was in a distant world, lagging behind human civilization. He noticed that such a house was considered rich in furnishings, and the mom holding him in her arms was very beautiful. Quite a fortunate reincarnation for an orphan who died of overwork from hard work. If he was to be the heir to not only the wealth, but also the beauty of his parents, there would be no problem on the love front. This life really seemed like a fairy tale to him. And now the boy is three years old. He is able to climb up on a stool and reach the windowsill. At last he could see the world around his home. The world outside his cradle, because of his age, seemed huge and really different from the usual modern world of people. They were two-story houses, made in medieval style, with smoke coming out of their chimneys, which indicated that there was no heating in this world, and everything was done with a stove. Suddenly the maid saw what the gentleman was doing and grabbed him, saying that the archduchess would swear. As it turned out, the baby's family was the Grand Duchy of the Kingdom in question. Afterward, as he grew older, he fully internalized the information about his identity. He was the legitimate son of the Grand Duke of Dragonia, in the Lionheart Kingdom, and was a young Grand Duke. In eighth year of his life, his father and mother gave their son his first sword. The brilliance of the weapon delighted the boy, for now he could become a true knight and hero. But the world was magical and the sword was not simple. He had to become a fantastic knight who controls his weapon by putting the power of his aura into it. He began to be trained by Saint Sir Gordic, who addressed the Duke's son simply by his first name. The boy's name was Leon. When he turned 14, the boy was already weary from hard training. He had to drag a huge boulder around in circles with a rope on his shoulder to improve his stamina and strength. Holy knights were indeed monsters in human skin, and it was considerably difficult to reach their level. First, through training and completing tasks, becoming a knight of the realm, one must accumulate experience and fame, and then be chosen by the Holy Grail and drink from its sacred water. In addition to the grueling training as a knight, Leon, as heir to Dragonia, had to learn everything necessary to become a great duke. During one of the training sessions with Kordik, the young man's first sword broke, and he only asked for God's mercy from such stress and pressure, even though he himself did not believe in any religion. In his sixteenth year, he was already a knight, and one day he was walking through the forest in search of the goddess who would bless him and give him the grail cup. And then he saw a fire nearby. If he accumulated experience and fame, the goddess would appear to give him the task. The settlement was attacked by a horde of orcs, and the knight moved there to protect the civilians. He was able to defeat the army of monsters by coloring his sword red. When he was twenty years old, he finally met a goddess for the first time. She was a beautiful girl with long golden hair and eyelashes, and her eyes were crystal blue. She was dressed in gold and white shining robes, and on her head was a shining jewel falling down on her forehead. Clasping his palms together in a lock, with half-lidded eyelids he spoke nobly and calmly. He turned to Leon, son of Wolfric Dragonia, to prove his honor and faith to her. He bowed on one knee in honor of the goddess Ariana, vowing to do her will. From then on, he believed only in his goddess. After many battles, he became a holy knight. And after that he didn't stop fighting. He slaughtered orcs, destroyed goblins, and eradicated the evil cult. Eventually Leon became the war knight of the entire kingdom, and this gave him the right to call other knights to battle. He killed 700,000 orcs, including women and children, without sparing the green creatures. In the 35th year of Leon's life, the great king, true saint, and demigod Arjun Majesty Lionheart passed away. It happened when the young Duke of Dragonia was fighting a great demon summoned by the Empire of Darkness. In addition to the orcs, the new problem was that the kingdom began to be attacked by demons, and at this time the gods do nothing to protect the people, and yet the knights have to continue to serve them faithfully. Leon cursed the mages of the empire as he saw the king off on his final journey. Now a new king was to be chosen among the holy knights, and the choice of the goddess fell upon Dragani. He inherited the symbol of honor and conviction, 
and transplanted to himself the sacred treasure he had received from Ariyama, the Lionheart. A great magical power of blue was instilled into the young man's soul, and he became the holy protector of the precious grail. Afterward, he put on his crown and sat on the throne. Now the great Duke of Dragonia became king of the kingdom of Lionheart. As the years passed, the king did not grow old, Perhaps the blessing of the goddess helped him not to lose his youth, or maybe that was the way the world was, where time flowed in its own way. And here he was in his 80th year, and he still looked like in his 20s, together with other knights defending the world from evil. Three great wars with the orcs happened. One of the goblins evolved into a fearsome demon, and the empire continued to make trouble, all because the enemies took in the northern pagans who were trying to be independent of God. The 90th year. The empire has gone mad. The leader of evil committed suicide, along with three million of his citizens. The Lord of Chaos was summoned to the capital, and Lian moved with his army into a new battle. Through a magical gateway, they stepped into the empire. In the 121st year of his life, the king reached despair. He was unable to protect the world that had been overtaken by doom. Together with the gods, he eradicated evil to the last, but he could not protect the people. He took the doll of a child who was no longer alive and laid it carefully on the ground in a burned village, telling one of his soldiers that he mourned the death of the young man's father. After shouting another motivational and inspirational speech, he directed his army towards the last to war. To the walls of his kingdom moved a huge horde of orcs and demonum. There was an incredible in the history of bloodshed. All the knights died, and only one holy knight did not tire and twenty-four hours fought all with his sword. The Chosen One of all gods slashed demons for years that turned into centuries, but the knight himself did not notice the current time. When he was 256 years old, he was able to destroy the last portal by getting inside it, and began to destroy the demons from within. It was a trap for him, because now he could not return to his native land, but there was nothing left of it anyway. It was the 300th year that Leon could cut off the head of a great demon, which flew off through a portal that appeared in space out of nowhere. A company of young men, apparently scientists of modern human civilization, were adjusting the doors between worlds. Before them, sparkling with a golden aura, stood a naked, handsome man with a sword in his hand. He urged them to fight against the demons with them. But after looking at the lost faces of the humans and their clothing that was different from the robes of his time, he realized that he had finally seen the earthlings. He was able to see the people of his past life. When he was 300 children, he introduced himself to them as Land Dragonia Lionheart, King of Valiant Knights doing the will of God. A gate to another world has opened in the center of Seoul. The level of the gate, black, could not be measured. The Korean Hunter Association and the World Hunter Association requested the major guilds to intervene in this matter, but all gave a refusal because the level of difficulty could not be determined. A hole opened up in the sky among the high rises, illuminated by a blue light. Down below stood the scientists and hunters, whose job it was to neutralize such anomalies. At these events, the government ordered the Korean Association to come forward first, which was tantamount to suicide. They moved the battle in a fantastic dimension, but still be monsters were not enough for ordinary people, until Leon appeared before them, who was able to instantly kill such a large-scale army and save a group of hunters from death. Among them was a young girl named Hari. She was dressed in a leather suit, and her hair was red in color, braided into a long braid. Kim Jinsu, the head of the Korean Hunters Association, began to call her by her title, Deputy Han Hari, while she was in remembrance of this meeting with the king. They had already finished the mission, but the horrifying images still surfaced before the employee's eyes. She had changed into a shortened shirt with a tie and jacket and short shorts that revealed a view of her beautiful legs. They sat in the reception area of the office. The supervisor handed his subordinate coffee, and they sat down in chairs to watch Leanne's interrogation through the tinted armored glass. They reasoned and shared their opinions on what? That was a level 4 demon gate that had a great demon behind it. It was a true miracle that they were able to survive without any guild support and were able to mop up everything. Of course, all the credit went to that golden-haired man with incredible power and strength. He was dressed in his usual clothes now, a sweatshirt and jeans, and sat listening to the agent, asking him questions to write up full information on the newcomer from another dimension. Gates were popping up all over the world, and over the last 30 years, there had been more and more of them, and the ones where people were found had common features. 
they were worlds that had been destroyed or were in the process of being destroyed. The survivors came to Earth retaining their magical power from the demon world. For this reason, the government tried its best to fulfill their needs in order to recruit them and use them for their own purposes. This interrogation was an attempt to recruit Dragani as well. Manager Kim worried about the cultural difference, for given how the man had introduced himself to them, there was no doubt that he was indeed of royal lineage. Hari replied that, in fact, the man understood them better than they realized, she sensed the kindness in his voice, and she was sure they had met a good man. But as soon as she said those words, Leon's loud voice shattered the armor-piercing glass that could block monster attacks. He began to call the crowd filthy scum, daring them to offer him beggarly food, disregarding respect and status. Fifteen minutes before that, this is what happened. He sat with an employee in an interrogation room under a surveillance camera. A bald man in sunglasses and a strict suit asked him formal questions. Between the two, the golden-haired man reflected on his past life in this world. I was an orphan who died at the age of 20 from overworked physical labor. A memory surfaced in front of him, in which he, as a brunette whose body was covered in abrasions and bruises, slept on a feudin in a shabby apartment, drinking the sorrows of life with cheap alcohol. Then I was reborn in another world. I was a knight and ruler of a kingdom for over a hundred years, and when the demons invaded the world, I hunted them for two hundred years. And now a gap of three hundred years has happened, and I still remember my past short life and my job at the construction site, though the memories are quite faded and transparent in my memory. In any case, there was no need to disclose the fact that I was an earthling. Then a young twenty-year-old orphan, doesn't a 300-year-old knight from the netherworld sound better? The king decided for himself, determined to present himself as he had in the past world, though he remembered the culture and social habits of this one. When the bald man addressed him by name, he irritably demanded to be addressed as Your Majesty, and afterward called the employee a plebeian. The agent began to address him on a technicality and specified that it was Leon who had destroyed those demons, to which he heard an affirmative answer. Dragony called the employee his temporary scribe, who was now recording his historic and outstanding battles for posterity, and then asked if his person did not want to show proper etiquette, which meant that he was hungry. The glasses-wearing agent immediately called for food delivery over the phone, and while they waited, the man told the king about this 30-year-old anomaly of portals opening in completely different places on the planet. As it turned out, each portal had a clear theme and purpose, and if left unattended the gateway would rupture the dungeon where all the monsters came from. Leon thought, for in his world, which had been overrun by demons, there was no such structure with clear themes and assignments. The undead just came in a general stream and devoured everything in their path to the point of total destruction. He was distracted from his thoughts by the dinner served. It was a seasoned, thick broth that had been boiled for a long time and crispy kimchi, solentan. Such food was mostly for those who were engaged in hard physical labor, and it was real food for the soul. He had eaten solentan often in his past life after a hard day at the construction site, and he still remembered the familiar taste and aroma. His stomach churned and drooled, but this dish connected him to a poor life, but now he was a man of blue bloods and would not allow himself to eat such beggarly food. He broke the table in half, screaming at the disrespect of these filthy scum, causing the armor-piercing glass to shatter. The plate of food fell to the floor, and the king continued to shout that he would not tolerate being fed peasant food, for he was Leon Dragony Lionheart, king from another world, messenger of the gods, guardian of the Holy Grail, and wielder of the holy sword and holy spear. He flared up and realized that there was little left of his past life in him, for when he returned to earth, he only began to think that the locals lacked proper faith and proper respect for high personages. He is still a night king, and though he is not shocked by the local technology, 300 years of living in a medieval world and being raised by the upper classes has left a huge imprint on his personality. Leon dined on a juicy steak, carefully slicing it with a knife and prying it with a fork as years of honed etiquette demanded. Outside the door of the room stood Han Hari with Supervisor Kim Jinsu and other employees. 
The supervisor coaxed his subordinate to come in and talk to the guest. The supervisor wondered how Dragon E realized that jajangmyeon and chicken was the food of mere mortals, but ended up eating a skillfully prepared piece of meat and 1993 wine. Hari refused to go in because of shyness and fear, but the staff assured her that since Leon had called her brave when they met, he would cooperate with her. The girl's goal was to get the Corol recruited into her association of hunters. Apologizing before interrupting the Majesty's meal, she went in to talk. He let her in, saying she was a good swordswoman, and expressed his respect for the cook who had prepared his steak but afterwards said that the reason he had given them so much trouble was not because of the food. The reason was the manners they showed toward the king, which put him out of sorts and led to unnecessary chores, such as cooking the steak instead of calling the cook beforehand and fixing the table. When I meet a representative of another country, he should be treated appropriately. Isn't this an attitude of prestige for your country? The man asked. He asked Hari to tell about this world. Perhaps, if your majesty doesn't mind, the Korean government will take care of you, said the girl, trying her best to keep the king on her side and the territory of her state. True, in order to settle in this world, I must have duties to go to the battlefield. If I am a noble knight, which I am, then I have a duty to fight, answered Dragumius. The girl had time to rejoice that such a strong warrior with superpowers was ready to join the association of hunters, but he started shouting saying that it was not proper for a king to lead his army under the flag of another country, and therefore he needed his own personal team, of which he would be the leader. After Hari's report, the government only acquiesced and gave maximum support to keep the esper. Hari was angry that the association and the government would have to bow down to this king of another world, but there was no choice, for among the competitors were not only the state hunter organizations of other countries, but there were also many privately funded groups in Korea itself that could lure a foreigner to join them. The Phoenix Guild was one of the most famous among them. While they were discussing such a scenario, the computers showed an alert phase that heralded a new open portal and an anomalous phenomenon. It was urgent to move to the underground breach on the Honan Plain. Because of the monsters breaking through the plains, there was a risk of destroying this fertile land, which would destroy the crops and it would hit the country's economy. In that place right now was the Phoenix Guild. Among them is S-ranked hunter Li Yongwang, and he would have been able to close the Orange Gate in such a time. And since that didn't happen, it's likely that his organization has its own devious plan. Lian heard everything that was going on outside the door. He thought about the fact that there was no one in these lands who could help restore the destroyed crops and remembered his goddess Demera who helped the lands of his kingdom to bear fruit so that her subjects would not need food. She felt his connection and smiled from beneath the hood of her robe. Meanwhile, the association arrived at the plain where all the rice fields had been killed. The aura of the portal had negatively affected the plant, and they began to rot and wither. The Phoenix Guild with their leader Li Yongwang stood in front of the gate and did nothing to clean up the dungeon. Leader Kim, along with Hari, realized that those had purposely provoked the dungeon breakthrough since they refused to act according to the terms of the private organization. During this year, the Phoenix Guild had continuously requested for tax exemption on the income generated inside the gate. They were making a lot of profit, particularly from magic crystals, materials and items, and monster carcasses, and now they wanted to be exempted from paying a trillion won tax, and now they had created a new natural disaster just to fill their pockets more. Han Hari began yelling at Yanwan to immediately close the gate, which has remained open for a week now, and if more time passes, the ownership of the gate will be transferred. The man replied that his guild was badly injured, but instead of wounded warriors, they had cunning and arrogant faces looking at them. Due to fatigue and injuries, they will not be able to attack, until tomorrow, they will try, but they don't know what will come out of it. The girl was even more furious at this manipulation, accusing the guild of lacking patriotism because they voluntarily polluted the plains. The man replied that in the modern world, power and money were considered justice, and that the unfertile lands were of no concern to him. They were approached by Leon, who had followed at their heels to assist the association. Hari addressed him by name, for which she was admonished that he could be addressed solely by title. 
Yan Wang was indignant that the European was interfering in their conversation, but he called him a low-class man and ordered him to shut his mouth. The head of the guild was shocked, but it was quickly explained to him that he was one of the survivors, so he could ignore his barbs because of the difference in culture. Lian asked Chief Kim what the matter was, and after hearing the explanation, he put forward his position. However, before he could help, he said that he had no right to arbitrarily conduct hostilities in a foreign territory. He would need to get permission from the local king first. Everything has a legal process and rules, and the association had to immediately call the president to assure the foreigner that he could act as he saw fit. For tomorrow, at the end of the raid, Leon would have to make a personal appearance to protect the land and remove the portal, and to do so, it was necessary to gather the women who had participated in the birth and have each of them make a doll. In the evening of that day, Hari called Dragonius to check the dolls made by the women who had come. He began to check each one, and afterwards, when he realized that they did not fit, he tore the straw dolls into pieces and put them in a common pile. When the last, beautifully and skillfully made doll was left, he decided that it was suitable, and after kissing the hand of the old woman, he asked how many children she had given birth to. The old woman replied that she had twelve, and the man was ready to give her an order and a monument for such a merit if he could, but alas, he did not have the necessary authority to do so. They returned to the plains, and the king began to perform the ritual. He put a wooden table on the ground and lit a candle, then put a doll in the middle and with the help of magic took out the holy grail from the invisible space. You are the mother of the fertile land, the people of this world offer you a harvest doll, please accept it, he cast a spell, after which the bowl began to fill by itself with a golden liquid that began to pour over the edges and into the toy. The observing association and guild were shocked and couldn't believe their eyes. After drinking all the contents of the cup, the doll stood up on its feet as if it was alive. Lionheart, my child, said the doll. The king appealed to Mother Earth, Demera, the goddess of life and fertility, for help. Leon told the goddess that this land also needs help, as demons are doing evil here as well, but the humans have no deities they can rely on, and so he asks her to conjure her magic, as he is now protecting these lands. Yang Wang became indignant and insulted, for which Lian had to apologize to Demira, but she reassured him by saying that ignorance and greed were not sins. That's what they call mortal life. She asked the king what he intended to do in the new world. The ineptitude that roams among the swordsmen may be covered with glory, but the right to authority is sacredly enshrined in law. I will make sure that duty and power are on equal footing here. I will teach the ignorant and lead them down the righteous path. Answered Majesty's question. Demera reached out to her child and then began to fulfill the request. Dear Demera, the free people in this land are suffering from evil energy. It may not be your responsibility, but please, please heal and cleanse this land. You are my priest, our champion. The earth of this world is not part of my body. Extend my deity and replace the arid earth with my body. Then everything on this earth will become your support, said the goddess, whose spirit hovered over the doll and the knight. A golden drop, previously drunk from the holy grail, dripped from the doll's handle and fell to the ground. Many drops began to run down the stems of the plants into the soil, and then everything began to glow with a golden, bright light. The fields of rice and other grains became golden, fresh, and full of color. The plains were saved, and the crops were better than before. The king began to shout at the people to see the power of the gods and believe, for now this world would move with the deity. Yan Wang began to swear that most likely these grains were now poisoned, and now they were in no way allowed to eat them. The readings of the PDA, whose magic power was wielded by one of the guild's espers, showed the results. Blessed seed rice of rare level. The rice is blessed with the divine power of Demera, the goddess of life and fertility. When consuming the rice, third stage diseases are improved. When consumed continuously, there is a high probability of complete healing from cancer and other diseases. The guild leader's last attempt to dissuade the association failed, the inspection made worse by showing that the crop could prevent disease. His plan to abolish the tax failed, and meanwhile King Lionheart shouted him down for daring to insult and disbelieve in the divine magic of Mother Nature. 
The team sent a man to report to the local manager about the condition of the fields and to bring a walk to check the condition of the cooked rice. Officer Kim's computer showed the result of the cooked white rice. Food made from seed rice restores stamina and strength by 100 every minute, mana recovery rate increases by 50 every minute, duration of effect up to 8 hours. This kind of food could be compared to a strengthening remedy for 3 million won. The association began to eat to replenish and increase their strength for the next dungeon sweep. Hanhari came running in with her portion and said that the power of the goddess had worked on the insects on the plains as well. She ate one bug and got buffs. The rest of the staff began catching bugs to gain even more power. The fighting spirit of the strategic team of the Hunters Association's strategic team increased greatly, all thanks to Leon. Meanwhile, he was talking to Demira. Giving her honor and his faith, they said goodbye. The doll was no longer alive, and the invisible hand of the girl's spirit stroked the golden-haired man's head like a small child. Maybe they are destined to meet again one day. He approached Hari and asked if there really was no deity on their planet, to which the girl said she could not give an answer. He began to explain that living with a deity and sincere faith in him is the key to humanity's harmony with nature, self, and work. When everyone had had enough, it was time to close the portal. The association began to move towards the open space when an evil plan crept into the mind of the Phoenix Guild chief. They were sure that many would give up their strength in the middle, just like the guild itself had, and since only Hari alone had rank A, everyone going would be real weaklings, and even a survivor from another world wouldn't be able to help them. He was sure that they would be defeated, as the hunters didn't yet know what a terrifying and powerful creature awaited them in the darkness that couldn't be killed by normal means. The team of hunters, armed, penetrated the gate. They were surrounded by a dark dungeon, similar to a dark cave. The essence of clearing the gate was that in addition to the simple uncleanness, one must be sure to kill the main boss himself, then one could consider the mission accomplished. Leon commented that he liked the one-on-one -on -one battle with the boss, but Hari kept silent, because in fact, they also attacked the boss always with the whole group. Moving further into the depths, they began to notice that there were many skeletons lying on the ground. The king said that he had heard from the guild that they had already tried to clear the dungeon, but they had failed, probably because there were too many monsters. Hari replied that this gate is special. The point is that it is here until you do not kill the boss in the first place. You will not kill the rest of the demons because he controls them and resurrects them again. It is worth it to fight them. The hunters have a suspicion that the local boss is a necromancer who controls skeletons. The red alert window of the portable computer popped up in front of Hari, which read, Dungeon Breach has begun. Death alert, all living beings within the gate will now have a time limit. Knight Commander Dullahan is advancing with his army. Defeat Knight Commander Dullahan in 3 minutes 0 seconds. A shiver of energy ran through the hunters and leader Kim bellowed, cursing the head of the Phoenix Guild for not warning them of the danger. In front of them stood a huge army of skeletons, blue flames shining from their eyes. A decapitated rider on a black horse stood at a distance from them, covering the army like a wall. His armor was also black and fire was also blazing from his neck where his head should have been. He held in one hand a huge two-handed sword and in the other his helmet, which he could not put on his shoulders. There were two minutes and fifty-eight minutes left. The hunters began to defend themselves. The archers stood farther away and began to shoot at the back rows of skeletons, and the shieldmen began to go for a ram, raking the bones with their shields. There were thirty archers in total, and only two mages, who were left for last to conserve their strength. Kim, the leader of the squad, was stopping the flow of monsters with his shield, while killing them with his long-handled hammer. But wasting so much of their strength was pointless, as the skeletons would continue to advance until they reached Dullahan. The battle could go on indefinitely. Hanhari stood away from everyone as being of strategic importance and tried to come up with a plan to capture the boss. While the hunters were fighting, the skeletons in robes were somehow doing inexplicable spells to strange considering they were dead puppets. With these spells, they were hitting the enemy with energy projectiles. Kim's leader was in danger, and there was still no way the girl could come up with the right plan to save her comrades. Kim was hit by a new projectile and crashed into the cave wall. 
Hari's assistant asked for a reserve force, but the main one refused to go through with the plan. She appealed to Leon for help, because with his powerful force he could defeat everyone instantly, but the man refused her, for the reason that the king does not fight such small and simple battles. The girl was taken aback, as this was definitely not a simple battle for her squad. Realizing he's stranger she would get no help from, she drew her sword, I went for the skulls, moving through the crown of skeletons directly like Dullahan. She asked her subordinates to support the leader and the rest of her comrades before moving forward. Pushing off another skull and jumping high, the girl swung her sword and swung her entire body to strike the hand that held the helmet, but the rider's other hand, holding a two-handed sword, blocked the blow, and the girl swept the entire length of her opponent's sword with the tip of her blade. She dodged, balancing on the ground and in the air, and looked into the blue sparkling eyes, hidden behind the metal of her helmet. The rider threw his head up to block the hunter's view and then slammed his fist into her stomach. She didn't have time to block the blow and flew off, crashing into the wall. He ran up on his horse towards her and was about to finish her off by raising a huge sword above his body. But the girl's range of fighting skills was very high. She instantly rose to her feet and summoning her magical power, swung her sword, causing orange flames to burn in the surrounding space. Lightning sparked from the girl's eyes. She accelerated her speed to lightning speed and wanted to strike from behind, but the enemy was able to block the blow with the blunt part of her sword and then hit the girl on her back with the blade as she tried to escape. The girl lay on the ground and her subordinates stood around her, panting from fatigue and wounds. A horseman stood between them, and then everyone heard the clapping of palms. It was Lionheart's applause. You wield a sword so admirably, despite having only one arm. I'm sure you used to be a noble knight. First, I apologize. To think that I could mistake a great knight like you for a mere undead. Leon spoke, addressing the rider, nameless knight. I, King Lionheart, give you the right to challenge me to a duel. There's no need to hurt soldiers, is there? Let's end this fight with a noble duel between two knights. The hunters and skeletons were shocked by this proposal. The rider agreed and got off his horse. Dragonius saluted the honorable knight and suggested that he put his head aside, for his weapon meant two arms under its control, and each of them had to fight at full strength. Majesty drew his holy sword from the magical space, and at that moment Hari ran up to him, saying that the boss could only be killed by a blow to the head, and since the rider had removed it at his request, it would not be possible to kill him in a duel. Leon asked the girl not to worry, as he had everything under control, and it was part of the plan. First Knight of Ariana, Goddess of Light and Justice, Great Duke of Dragonia, Lionheart of Lionheart, I challenged the noble knight. The duel began. The rider began to charge at the king as he stood calmly in a noble stance. Dullan swung his sword, and it collided with the thin blade of his opponent's weapon. The latter did not move and continued to stand still, fending off his enemy's attacks with light, graceful blows that did not force him to awaken his magical or even physical strength. Lionheart was so strong that this fight was like holding the fist of a small child. With one arm bent at the elbow and hidden behind his back at waist level, Leon kept his body still and his legs steady yet light as he blocked blow after blow with a single movement of the hand holding the weapon. After the enemy's attacks, Leon would deliver his own blows, counting them one by one. Dullahan fell to the ground, his armor covered in scratches, but he nobly and steadfastly got back to his feet and continued to fight. He spun around, trying to hit the king in the head with his two-handed sword, but the king again deflected the blow and struck his own. None of those watching could understand what had happened in an instant, and only Hari alone picked up on the brilliant attack explaining it to her shocked comrades. The moment the sword touched, Leon twisted his sword and changed his center of gravity. On top of that, he performed a transverse movement. The girl never had the guts to perform such an element. She was the best graduate of the academy and the best swordswoman of the association, and Lionheart's technique made her really excited. The rider lay on the ground without strength. Lionheart pointed the tip of his blade at him and counted his second strike and ordered him to retake his position. 
As they fought, the rider's mind began to flash back to a transparent, long-forgotten memory in which he had been a noble knight serving his king with honor and faith and defending his homeland. The darkness consumed his dead spirit, making him a demon. But in a fair duel with the honorable knight, the true essence began to break through, defeating the dark forces. Another blow was blocked by the king. How long ago that was? The time when I was treated like a knight and challenged to a duel. This is very likely a ploy to overcome difficulties. Anyone would have thought so upon hearing the suggestion to get off the horse. Absurd. Thoughts began to run through the headless rider, incapable of speech. He observed his opponent, appearance and stance like a veteran who had been to countless battlefields. Glittering eyes that chase honor and glory. This was how Leon's enemies saw him, and whether it was even the undead, he couldn't help but inspire admiration. He deflected another blow. He swung his sword and pushed away his opponent, who began to fall on his back under the weight of his sword. It was the third time Dalahan fell to the ground, signaling the end of the duel. This is exactly the limit of honor that all knights dream of. A king of knights that is fashionable to look up to and challenge. I don't want to use the magic I used as a necromancer, because I'm a knight. Straight up, crossing swords without any magic, I want to cross swords with this man again and again. In the life I forgot about, roaming the world as a noble knight and fighting with glorious knights, thought Dullahan. When asked by Leon if he would still continue the duel, the rider stood up and began to attack again. The blows continued to be blocked and followed by strikes from the enemy. Soon the double-armed man fell to the ground for the tenth time. Your swordsmanship is becoming more and more sophisticated. Are the memories of your life starting to come back to you? The king asked. Ah, noble knight, you have brought back to me a fallen spirit, glorious days from the past, the demon tried to say, but all he got was a guttural, groar sound. He accepted his defeat and approached one of the skeletons, who had been holding the trusted head of his ringleader all along. The rider took the helmet and knelt before King Lionheart, reaching out to him with his hands holding his life source. Ah, uh, how much time has been spent in slaughter? How many battles have been repeated without a drop of honor? If this accursed journey can end like this, there is no greater happiness than this. Thought the horseman with regret for his demon life, but with faith and peace in his last moments. Leon was glad for the demon's ability to restore his honor, and promising him to pray for him, he touched the helmet held out to him with his palm. If there is a god in whom you believe, let him soothe your soul. If not, may the goddess guide you to the Garden of Eden, illustrious knight. May we meet at the Feast of the Gods. May the light come said his blessing from the holy king. The entire space was flooded with a golden light that destroyed the darkness. The helmet began to shatter into fragments, which began to dissolve in the sparkling light. In the place where the head was missing, the cheerful face of a noble knight who had given his life with honor appeared. A smile shone on his lips, and his black armor changed to silver. The light consumed his soul and sent him to rest. At the same time, the skeletons disappeared as well. Hail Leon Dragony Lionheart, said the knight at last. After a while, the whole team returned to the plains. The sky was already sloping toward sunset, turning various shades of pink, orange, and purple. Before returning, the hunters set up camp and counted the artifacts they had taken from the dungeon. The leader Kim and Hari reflected on the holy power of their new comrade, and the girl made the remark that since he could wield such a power of light, he would have used it sooner. But Leon, who had crept up on them, replied that in that case, that noble knight would not have been able to meet his end as a great general, and his sins would not have been absolved. Dullahan was a noble warrior and would receive his due in the other world. The girl stopped arguing and began examining the looted treasure again. They were lying on the ground. One of the items was a dark purple magic orb emitting a mysterious light from its depths. The two employees glared at the relic certain that this attribute was definitely very powerful and would come in handy. But Leon immediately stepped on it with his foot, shattering it into tiny shards of glass. The girl looked at him indignantly again, but he explained that the thing was ruined and should be disposed of, as it could only bring misfortune. The hunters, who dreamed of selling the artifact for a lot of money, listened sadly to the words of a man who belonged to that world 
and knew what cursed things were. What they had left in their arsenal was a large sword and Dullahan's cloak, which had survived, unlike the rest of the necromancer's body. There were also a few precious magical stones. Honam Gate has been successfully mopped up. Hanhari was walking down the corridor, wheeling forward a cart with a covered breakfast and several bottles of expensive wine. It had been four days since Leon had come to Earth, and it had been a great burden for the unfortunate girl as the man had made her his personal assistant. Most likely, it was the fact that she was better with a sword than anyone else in his new entourage. So he decided to trust her, and the association itself placed its hopes on her to ensure the survivor's life. All this responsibility and a huge number of tasks, the fulfillment of which did not require waiting, the girl did not have time to eat and sleep. She had bruises under her eyes, and smelling the aroma of the breakfast intended for her guest, she felt even more weak. At first there was a big fuss about taxes. Hey, how can a king ask a foreign king to pay taxes? Kings aren't supposed to count coins. How can you argue with a king about what his servants should do? Sounded in the eardrums of Lionheart's angry voice. The deputy chief couldn't explain the nature of taxation in her world in the 21st century and that his title of king from another dimension didn't affect the politics of the lands of this planet, and moreover, he needed citizenship, for he couldn't be an ambassador of a non-existent country, and therefore had to become a taxpayer. Eventually, the association took care of that, deducting taxes from the earnings that had to be paid to Leon as a hunter. Then new believers were accepted to establish the deity in the land. Leon dressed in a suit and tie, and together with his new assistant, approached the people in the villages near the Honam Plains, who were aware of the magical fertile soil, and were willing to accept the faith whose miracle had taken place before their eyes. The elderly villagers asked the king how they could be paid the offering. Lionheart replied with a sum of 19 trillion, to pay a share of the harvest as an offering to show his generosity for the sake of faith. The old man was shocked. Taxes and living expenses were already too high, but to pay another 90% of the harvest as taxes was too brazen. The farmers resented this robbery and asked how they would benefit from it. The king made a remark about how dare a devotee of the goddess worry about his stomach. His guild was prepared to settle all matters of food and lodging, of welfare and life, for the land would now be protected by the followers of the fertility goddess Demera. Hari added on her own behalf that the blessed rice was highly prized, ready to be paid 150 million for 80 kilograms. The old men agreed, giving a ninth of it, since they were still on the plus side for such a kilo rate anyway. Leon was very proud of the way he was beginning to run his business. Even though he had lived a hundred years in the Middle Ages, it was not difficult for him to learn the economics of the modern world. In the end, the biggest problem was Dragani's accommodation. At first he was put in a simple room, sparsely decorated, and came to be horrified by the lack of any decor and artwork. A request came from him, demanding a room with the most luxurious bed, as well as constantly available services and a creation of art for constant enjoyment. In the end, they checked out late at night, and Hari had to call hotels on the street, asking for a five-star room, until two o'clock in the morning. When they were able to find the right room, the exhausted girl, sitting on her knees and with tears in her eyes, begged Her Majesty not to be picky anymore and to go to bed. It was agreed to make a concession in terms of placing the paintings and ceramics that adorned the hotel within certain conditions. This is the way things are in the present tense. The girl entered the guest's room, announcing her arrival. The young man was sitting in an armchair, looking out the window at the stunning view of Seoul. He was wearing a light yellow-colored hotel robe, revealing a view of his muscular chest and abs. He was relaxedly drinking a glass of wine. The girl served him breakfast. The man noticed the tired look of the assistant and clarified whether she had eaten breakfast, and after hearing a negative answer, he told her not to forget about meals and to eat when she had time. Drooling over the meat in sauce and sesame oil, she reminded herself to eat at least a sandwich when she had a spare moment. Leon told the girl to sit down. She had time to be pleased that he had invited her to eat breakfast with him, but when he saw that she was just sitting motionless in a nearby chair, he clarified that he meant for her to slice his ribs. She being a commoner and not daring to eat with him, and a disappointed huntress, began to slice the food for the pampered king. 
After eating all the breakfast and changing their clothes, the two espers left the multi-story luxury hotel and drove the work car to the king's new apartments. The Hunters Association has decided to provide grants and subsidies to His Majesty. Even if it's not as big as the royal palace, we'll get you a place where you can permanently reside, Hari said. With a wistful look, the king replied that it was a great concern, and he, as a guest, dared not ask much, and therefore entrusted everything to her. Afterward, the deputy leader asked about the booty obtained from the gate, and that the knight replied that she herself could dispose of all that property, leaving him only Dullahan's cloak as he liked it. It was a top-quality apartment complex close to the association itself, which was an advantage for transportation. The building also had a helipad, which was also a convenience. But as they walked inside, he saw a traditional Asian installation of stones arranged in a turret, and his refined European taste was again disappointed, but now in his apartment, he could create as much interior design as he wanted, and no more overnight stays in hotels were required. This was the small joy of his present position. As they entered the lobby, they were greeted by a man in a business suit. Hari became anxious, since their movements today had been strictly confidential, and now they were being greeted and addressed by name, as if they knew in advance that they would arrive at this place at this hour today. The man introduced himself as Director Park Zhongshan, of the Dujong Group, who was in charge of Dujong Future Products. It was a large-scale corporation creating technology and weapons for hunters and other government needs. A vapor appeared on the girl's forehead, and she strained a welcoming smile. Dujong Group is one of the largest conglomerates in Korea, and the fact that its representative was expecting us is not for nothing, she thought to herself. The man honored the survivor and called him by name, which confirmed Hari's hunch. But no matter how hard the director tried to make the guest look friendly, he received a grimness and a squeamish attitude in return. Leon looked down at him, angrily resenting the fact that some merchant dared to call him by name and want to shake hands with him. Walking past with the girl, he went up to his new apartment. The director of the corporation was insulted that some tourist had dared to do such a thing to him, for in the realities of their world, he was much higher in status than this savage. But he was not going to abandon his plan, and he decided to continue to pursue Leinhardt's favor. This place will be provided to you by the association for one year. You don't have to worry about the monthly rent and maintenance fees, because the Hunters Association will take care of everything. The girl explained, Oh, there is also room service or cleaning. It is also included in the full service fee, so you can use this apartment in peace. The men hummed in response. He was already used to the local rules, technology, and clothing. Though his time in this world was short, he was not surprised by any new things in his life, and he absorbed all the information on the fly. The girl felt strongly about what happened in the lobby. The information about the survivors was top secret. The situation of not knowing why Park Chonchin decided to get close was very stressful. It was a blessing for Han Hardy that King Leon ignored Director Park because the girl was confused and wouldn't know what action to take if the situation went the other way. When they were settled in their new dwelling, the girl asked the king what he might have come to him for. To which Dragani replied that there was probably only one thing that could attract a merchant, and that was profit. And then it dawned on Hardy that Pak Chongchen wished to derive her profit from the blessed rice of the Honan Plains. Due to the emergency situation, the information was not controlled properly, and one internet broadcaster took advantage of the situation and filmed what was happening, and although the association recommended that the video be removed, it was posted again on electronic platforms. An account called Farmer Pack posted a video of Leon Blessing and revitalizing the soil by making magic rice, and the video garnered 498,000 views. Most likely, this new account was Dudgeon Group's very own director, Park Chanchen, and was using it to play his foul game. Meanwhile, Mr. Pack himself sat in his office, over a cup of coffee, and watched the video's views grow, asking his analyst if the scheme was sure to work, to which the subordinate replied, no doubt. The scientists in his labs had not even properly tested the healing properties of this rice, which made the director himself question whether it was worth investing in it economically. They tested it on rats, 
but is there any guarantee that it is not dangerous to humans? Pack's secretary said that in order to test on a large number of seeds, he had to find the owner of the fields, but there was no point in research if there was an old, half-dead guard dog in the area who suddenly ate the rice and was rejuvenated and cured of chronic inflammation and runny nose. It is said that, she continued, all the villagers have been cured of minor illnesses and serious chronic diseases by eating cooked rice. We have not been able to obtain data from clinical trials, but these facts are as good as confirmations of the effect. The man was satisfied with the reports of his staff and grinned slyly, anticipating the coming profits. But then he remembered again the haughty look in Leinhardt's eyes and was angry that he had dared to call him a petty peddler when he had such influence over the economy of the whole country. It was decided to continue asking for an audience, no matter how much the arrogance of another high-ranking man who didn't know how to negotiate as an equal would hurt his ego. Halt man. He dares to look down on me. He thinks he's the center of the universe because of one rice. You've met the wrong opponent, a barbarian survivor. He's just like the other survivors. Thinks the world he lived in is the best, the one that came from some ancient civilization. I'll hit you with culture shock, savage. Director Pack shouted with an evil laugh and slammed on the table. Leon, back on Earth, set himself three goals. The first was to spread the faith. There were many gods and followers on Earth, among them various religions and mythologies, but there was no truly important holy power. The multitude of faiths were centered on fear for one's sins and submission, and there was no harmony with self and nature for deities to descend upon the lands of mortals to help them with their various problems. Man must experience faith in God and extend his favor. The idea that diseases and pollution of the earth are the punishment of higher powers was a judgment fallacy. True gods work for the good of their followers, those who believe in their power, and they manifest it to them and dare not drown their precious peoples in disease, war, and disaster. Those were concentrates of negative and evil energy, which accumulated in different ways led to different troubles, natural disasters, epidemics, and wars. So, in order to utilize the holy powers, a new faith must be propagated, since the existing ones do not live for the benefit of the believers themselves. The number of followers must increase. The second goal was to reconstruct the Knights of the Holy Grail. In this world, there was no battle troop that used holy powers to eradicate demonic energy and sanctify spaces. He wanted to recreate his knight army, dressed in shining armor and using holy swords created by skilled blacksmiths to lead them into battle like in his home kingdom. He did not like the order of the association, he was accustomed to a different kind of fighting, and wanted to get himself such a license and valiant warriors under his wing. If the guardian of the Holy Grail, the Lionheart, is a demigod, then the knights of the Holy Grail are living saints who stand just below him. A difficult task was set to find the best and most fearless fighters with pure hearts. They are knights of the gods, utilizing the sacred laws as well as the fear of all demons. And the last goal of the great king was to eradicate all evil on earth. He could not help and save his kingdom, but he was given a chance to help a new country and planet to get rid of the demonic gates from which the evil comes out, poisoning everything in its path. The whole way of his life and his debt to the gods was to exterminate the demons, and since he had already lived for over 300 years, he did not know how long he was destined to live, but his soul would not rest until the last creature that went against the people who accepted him into their ranks died. He spoke his goals and dreams as a commandment and pondered how to fulfill the second point. Among the courtiers here, it would be too much to expect the appearance of holy knights, with the presence of abilities to be fit to be knights of the Holy Grail. The problem was that even skillful and well-trained fighters honestly serving their country might not be suitable. They had to be truly chosen warriors, who Lian could recognize at a glance as the kind of knight with whom he could fight hand in hand. He was standing near the window in his new apartment, throwing off the jacket of his uncomfortable and unfamiliar suit and drinking exquisite wine from a glass again. Hari called out to him, informing him that someone had come to his door and was requesting an audience. He replied in the affirmative and moved to an armchair to listen to the guests. It was Director Park again with two assistants. They thanked His Majesty for allowing an audience. Right, 
If it's for corporate profit, it's a cakewalk for me to bow my head to this savage, Leon pondered. Director Pack had prepared a special gift for him to express his honor and pure sincere intentions of gaining the king's favor, which of course was a lie. It's a luxury item that this savage never even dreamed of. Once he tastes it, he'll never be able to go back to the old days. He'll be asking us to bring him more of these. Pup grinned slightly in his mind. In front of them is a large metal suitcase. The director asked to accept the present, to which the king briefly replied, Prima Donna. The director was struck by the attitude of this man who spoke as if he was doing a favor by accepting a gift from others. Changshan asked to see the gifts and give his opinion on them. Lian didn't get up from his seat and ordered Hari to open the suitcase. She pressed a panel with a light touch of her fingertips and the doors of the suitcase swung open, revealing an arsenal of high-quality swords. These were the latest weapons and the hallmark of the Dungeon Company, of which the corporation was very proud. It didn't impress the king, and he continued to stare at the scene with a bored look. Director Park offered to choose any weapon he liked and evaluate it in his hands. Hari was delighted and clarified, was it really that unique weapon made by craftsmen directly under the guidance of the Dujong Guild? Puck replied that it was the highest quality weapon of the highest level. The girl glowed and didn't hide her love for cold weapons. Are they really just giving us the Dujin Guild's unique weapons? Such high quality weapons that can't be bought even with a lot of money. When I was a cadet at the academy, I only saw such a treasure on YouTube. The huntress couldn't believe her eyes. The director continued to assure the king of the usefulness of this gift, as he planned to continue acting as a hunter. A full arsenal would certainly come in handy. That's enough. Where am I supposed to use such a low-grade weapon? Lionheart asked irritably. Hari gloomed and clarified whether he had accurately called the gift low-grade or whether she had misheard. But the answer didn't change. How can you create a famous sword if you don't bathe it in the energy of the stars and if it hasn't received divine blessing? Are your weapons meant only for hunting beasts? Dragani finally humiliated the Dungeon Corporation with his assessment of their best work. To create a holy weapon, which is used by the representative of the divine will, it is really necessary to recreate the hands of a skilled blacksmith, washing in the sparkling golden light of the stars, and then the descended goddess, dressed in a robe, and opened her large wings covered with white feathers, with the help of a magical staff will bestow her favor on the given weapon, so that it will serve faithfully and truthfully to its owner. What kind of nonsense is that? You want guns dried in the sun like peppers and pastors reading prayers over them. He's out of his mind. Director Park was indignant in his thoughts, but outwardly only stood there with a confused look, pouring out in nervous sweat. Lian said that the merchant didn't inspire much respect. However, merchants always try to promote their goods wherever they can. The headmaster became really angry at the insult he had received and asked for an explanation for such a harsh assessment. Lionheart replied that it was like using a knife to chop cows when you want to butcher a chicken. He demanded that his weapon be tested, because it is not correct to speak of quality without trying it in the hand. The king agreed, but continued to sit, and then took out his ancient holy sword from the magical vault, covered with various scratches like the scars on a warrior's body. It was a beautiful sword, it shone with pure silver luster, and its hilt was made of gold. Pulling out some ancient sword, he's going to despise me until the end, that fucking savage, thought Chongshin with a mask of contempt and at the same time, despair. He suggested that Deputy Han Hardy take any sword she liked. She looked at Lionheart with a confused look, but she chose one. She picked up the finest sword, Master Park Jintol's Dawn Sword. She had been dreaming of holding this legendary blade for four years, admiring it only in images on the internet. It was a black-colored sword whose scabbard was red. The blade itself emitted red ethereal smoke, and the hilt was of dark yellow metal a color reminiscent of dirty gold or bronze. She felt the power of this sword. It had been tested for ten days under the scorching sun of the special gate when it was developed. It was infused with the energy that could reflect the energy within the dungeons, a true weapon for a first-class hunter. She asked Leon if he could wave it around, to which she got a metaphorical response that sounded like, when you're holding a toy, what good is it to ask adults for permission? 
She gripped the hilt of her sword tighter, and with her fire magic, she pointed it at the king. He closed his eyes and covered his mouth with one hand and lazily deflected the lunge, which shattered the dawn like a broken bottle. Everyone was shocked. The man replied that this sword couldn't even leave even a small trace of fire, and the whole thing was a waste of time. He asked the director of the corporation not to waste his time, and as quickly as possible to state his request for which he had come, and gave him only three minutes for the whole monologue. A bewildered director Pack, whose ego had been shattered along with his corporation's best sword, bowed in respect and entreaty, along with his subordinates, who were even more numerous than they had been before. They asked the king for a patent on rice seeds. The king became angry and demanded to ask for a request. The director immediately began to explain the favorable deal. Our management estimates the value of the rice to be 180 billion won. You will need to sign a contract that will only help Dujon Company distribute this rice. If you want, we can raise the price a little depending on our further negotiations, director said. The king clarified, not realizing at once whether his blessed rice was really to be bought for money, and when he heard all this speech, he became as gloomy as a black cloud. The formidable appearance of a lion heart appeared above his body. It was an aura in the form of an enraged lion whose eyes shone with a blue light. How dare you blaspheme? He asked, listening to how the holy land of his revered goddess, Demera, was being used to try to make a business out of the holy land of his revered goddess, Demera, and make money. That damned merchant dares to insult a deity, Leon asked rhetorically. Director Park tensed up considerably and felt the pressure of an alien aura. It was as if he saw a giant lion right in front of him, which only shouted the word kill and opened its fanged mouth ferociously. Changshan kneeled down, resting his palms on the floor and lowering his head in despair. He was Gu Tassin, who had been working as an independent hunter at rank D for ten years now. He had a family to provide for, so he had gone to try his luck once again to get a higher rank so he could earn more money. The young man met his old acquaintance, Mr. Gu, an employee of the association who would be administering the test. They decided to have coffee together before the start, discussing together the latest events of life, and the hope that this time Taysen had succeeded in getting a C grade while they were talking a handsome European man with blonde hair, dressed in a strict suit and sunglasses, walked past them. He had an air of confidence about him. Mr. Gu wanted to address him in English, but he replied in Korean in a peculiar way and began to walk away from them so that they would not detain him. The foreigner's blue eyes lingered on the hunter, and he noticed the stare. Afterwards, everyone was called for testing. Leon was escorted to room number nine. The scientists and observers greeted the king, giving his full name and registration number 77. They asked him to touch his intricate machine, which looked like many metal arcs intertwined with each other, and in the center was a core in the video ball. Upon touching this machine, it would turn on and then analyze and give the result of that person's power level. Leon refused to touch it, saying that the king's power was not subject to evaluation and testing. No one could argue with him, and he insisted on going to the next test with the other hunters. He was of course taken, but still as an examinee. Along with a group of other participants, he came to the gate of Seoul Station. Normally, it is customary to close and clean up cleaned up gates, but some are left for profit. And one of those places is the Seoul Station Gate. Gu Tansen was worried about not being able to rise above his previous level, and having passed this test not for the first time, he knew that overall evaluation and teamwork were important. He began to look at the other contestants and graded them as the examiner led them to the right place. Among them were a very young boy and girl, an older man and that young European man. They began to introduce themselves by name and divide into positions. The first to introduce himself was Gu Taizong, an experienced hunter whose specialty was dealer, followed by brother and sister Shin Tahan and Shin Nayan. The guy used a shield and spear, while the girl used a dagger and a bow and arrow. They were very green rookies whose strength had only recently awakened, and they had only gone to a hunter training course for three months. After was an old man named O Gangta. Despite his advanced age, he had only been a hunter for five years, 
His strength had awakened late in life, and his weapons were only boxing gloves. Hu Taizong had already doomed himself to failure. The blonde man didn't bother to introduce himself, saying a weird line about how you couldn't use a sword to kill a dragon to catch a chicken. No one understood him, so they listened to the examiner. He told them that further in the forest they were waiting for fifty monsters that came out of the gate called kobolds. They are wolf-like demons in armor, and there may also be gnolls, similar to the first demons, but stronger and bloodthirsty, but then the tester himself will enter the fray to protect the weaker hunters. The girl saw that Leon had no weapons and offered him a bow, but he threw it on the ground, calling it the weapon of cowards who do not want to go into a real fight. The team began to move into the forest. At one point they were surrounded by several kobolds. Despite the inexperience of the trainees, Tahan was able to wield his spear and shield, while Nayan fired her bow. One wolf attacked Tahan, while Tazen fought another wolf with his sword. The sister shot at the monster that tried to grab her brother, but at that moment another creature dragged the spearman after her. At that moment, the old man deftly managed to kill the demon with a single blow of his gloved hand and save the teenager. They praised each other and counted who could kill how many by the marks of their weapons. Afterwards, they made a remark to the blonde man that he was participating with them but not fighting, but soon they ignored him because the observer said that he would be evaluated individually. Everyone continued on their way. They decided to go deep into the cave, where they planned to stack straw and dry branches to smoke out the monsters that were hiding to attack. This plan seemed quite reliable to everyone, because they needed to kill all 50 demons as soon as possible. Leon tried to stop them, saying they could strategize better, but not listening to him, because the dealer thought he was an inexperienced hunter, Tayson lit the fire. The kobolds started to come out of the darkness. Everyone grabbed their weapons and started throwing rocks at the monsters. The girl shot them with her bow, hitting them squarely on their skulls. While they were busily raining boulders on the beasts, they heard a terrible roar. Tayson immediately realized it was the Null Captain. Now there was an understandable error in such a plan. By endangering a large gathering of kobolds at once, those called upon their leader for no defense. It was much more effective to kill the monsters one by one, but now, with the incoming boss, the newcomers could not win. It was a huge monster in armor, resembling a dog or a bear. Its strength and danger was much higher than rank C. It began to charge at the dealer, raking the ground with its clawed paws. The young lad was terrified, and now his problem was not raising his rank, but trying to survive. Seven years ago, everyone was celebrating Catholicism Day. On the same day, a catastrophe called the opening of the dungeon unexpectedly struck. It took the lives of many innocent people and, unfortunately, the parents of a young boy named Song Yoon. And then, having lost the most important thing that had no value, he firmly swore and decided that he would defeat the hated monsters at all costs and avenge his family at any cost by becoming a hunter. Back in the present, Song Yoon was dishonorably kicked out of hunter training school. The words of his mentor, frank and heart-wrenching, were running through his head. He was told he was too talentless to become a hunter. After all, he had not moved one step forward in seven years, and had not even raised his stats. Some Jun had to leave or else the reputation of the training center would fall, and naturally the administration would not be pleased. However, there was pity for him, because he never missed a single training session. Although, it would seem, what fool would stand still for so many years, knowing that he wasn't moving forward? but still continue. An irritated Sung Yoon crumpled the can of soda. Somewhere nearby was a woman and her daughter. The mother was reminding her, apparently well studied by her daughter, of the death of her husband, her father. The daughter repeated the words clearly imprinted in her memory. Follow her dead father's example, look at the difficulties with your head held high, and never give up. It was these words that gave him hope and faith in himself. Sung Yoon jumped up abruptly and quickly walked over to them, bowing in gratitude. He realized that he too could not give up. Then he ran as fast as he could, encouraged by the thought that guided him to the right path. Song Yun rushed toward the leader's house. Rain. The young man knocks on the door. After a few seconds, it opens and the mentor himself shows up. The boy asks for one last chance to take the exam, despite the supervisor's attempts to chase him away. In the wake of this insistence, the instructor becomes enraged thinking that the boy has come to collect the money he used to pay for his studies. Sung Yun can't stand it, 
shouting an exclamation against him, in response to which he is slapped in the face. He flew straight into a garbage can. After sitting in the puddle for a while and already despairing, he suddenly heard the voice of the test tower, praising him for his will of steel. Sonyan was perplexed as unknown azure forces enveloped him. And then it was as if he was drowning in the abyss, sinking deeper and deeper and gasping for breath. However, the young man is pulled into some space and again a voice is heard, telling him that the test tower has chosen the special ones, the strongest on earth. Then the same voice prompts Song Yun to choose the level of difficulty on which the reward depends. Sung Jun hesitates a little, but his inner voice takes over, and he chooses one of the levels offered. He moves into what's called the first challenge tower, the desert. From somewhere above he is presented with a sword. The theme of this challenge becomes survival, the reward for which is the discovery of unique characteristics. When he hears unique characteristics, the excitement overwhelms him, and he is filled with determination because this is what he has been trying so hard to achieve for all seven years. The surface beneath him rises sharply and collapses, a learning challenge of high complexity. An enraged golem emerges from the sand, heading straight for Song Yun. On top of everything else, there is an added time in which he must fold out and survive. The ten-minute countdown has begun. The frightened boy rushes away from the danger, but stumbles. For each failure, he dies and the ordeal begins all over again. Events repeat themselves, forming a vicious circle. Song Yun is still trying to overcome this challenge and solve the problem in a different way. In the end, he chooses to fight face to face with the sand golem with the sword given to him before the test begins, because running away from him enemy all this time is not enough strength and stamina. The same thoughts of his dismissal from the training center, the hated mentor shaming the young man, and the taunts of misunderstood, insolent and arrogant people begin to stir. His hatred of such memories prompted him to dig into his theoretical knowledge, which he possessed better than anyone at that school, trying to find the key to victory. Song Yun swerved away from his enemy to confuse him and slid his sword across the sand, thereby knocking the clumsy foe to the ground. And so he struck the first blow, thrusting his sword with all his might into the golem's heart in anticipation of victory. No, it was too strong, and the sword left only a pathetic crack not enough to shatter the core. Hoping he swung again, but before he could, the monster encased the young man in its huge, strong and impenetrable hand. Song Yun cried out, seeing again the guise of the leader before him. The cry was filled with despair, but more with anger. It was as if everything had turned into a horrible nightmare. He was tormented by the same sarcastic phrases that brashly crept into his thoughts, unwilling to leave his mind. But they served as the strongest jolt of all, giving him enough energy for one last push. Gathering all his remaining strength together, Song Yun hurled the sword drenched in his own blood right into the center of the core. There was so much hatred, lust for revenge, feelings of injustice, and despair that the blow was crushing, and he overpowered the sand golem. There was still seven minutes of time left, and our hero had already coped and completed the difficult challenge. Without strength, the guy fell to the sand, still not believing that he could do the impossible for someone like him. The young man rejoiced and at the same time was completely exhausted. As a reward for his victory, he received the unlocking of a unique characteristic, a thousand points, as well as accelerated regeneration and five hundred bonus points. Emotions were running high. For all seven years of hard training as a reward for his efforts, spilled sweat along with blood, received only ridicule and humiliation, and never increased the stats. And now, Son Yun's long-awaited unique characteristic of necromancy. He was filled with self-satisfaction and victory. His musings were interrupted by black smoke looping near a strange figure. He reached out to it, and the opportunity to absorb the spirit of the dead golem arose. The young man made a choice, and by that hour all the unexplored power, the spirit of the sand golem, was sent to him, causing his skill to increase by 7%. He could feel it in his chest, but could not understand how it would dwell there. More importantly, however, how could it be used? Finally, the boy felt his stats and strength rise. It had only been a measly couple of minutes, and he was so much stronger. If he had returned to the training center with such skills and a unique characteristic, everyone would have looked at him with envy. But here, somewhere in the distance, a portal of the same abyss of water opened, ready to guide him into the waiting room. He hesitated, but out of desperation there was nowhere else to go but through the portal. So Song Yun headed straight into it. I was thrown to the floor of some spacious room. His wounds were not trifling at all, but his magical powers restored him immediately, leaving no trace after the epic battle. As mentioned above, the room was large, 
with only one bed and nothing more. Still the boy was grateful for at least that. Falling onto the bed, he immersed himself in thoughts of the impending, perhaps difficult, future. At last he lay at peace, nothing troubling him except the buzzing questions that needed to be answered. What did the tower choose him for? Why go through all these trials? When will he be able to return, and what will he have to go through to finally finish? The voice of the tower once again interrupted the young man's rest. It provided a choice of five commands, including inventory, information, challenge, store, and community. If you say one of them, there will be an automatic execution. She then announced the beginning of the next challenge, which was almost 24 hours away. Some June uttered the word community, and as a consequence, a discussion chat room opened up. There he found out that ordinary people, not just hunters, were also dragged into the trials. Chaos reigned. Lots of unanswered questions. Many have had their stats cancelled and are gaining them back. Everyone is asking some questions, trying to get to the bottom of it, but nothing comes out. And then an unknown administrator entered the chat room, banning correspondence. He wrote important necessary information for the player. The main currency, which can only be obtained in the trials, these points. Without them, you cannot get a drop of water. They can be transferred and exchanged in the community. In short, without points he cannot survive and will have to go through trial after trial. Then, after reporting the news, the administrator left the chat room, reopening access to the correspondence. She was pointless, Sung Yoon set up store. He purchased a shield and began to train hard. After all, just because everyone's stats are down doesn't mean he's on the same level as everyone else and will be able to outdo them. It's every man for himself. After a while, Song Yun collapsed to the floor with no strength. Fortunately, the healing effect immediately restored them. The young man was hungry, and, hoping to find something, he opened his inventory. He had very few points left because he had bought many vital items, including the shield, which he couldn't even dream of without the bonus points. There were fewer and fewer messages in the chat room, the discussion dwindling by the hour. As the test approached, 24 hours flew by. Seconds were seconds away from the second trial. Nine, eight, three, two, and finally one second, the test began. The entrance to the second floor of the test tower was realized. Song Yan moved into the forest, the difficulty of the test high again. The theme was killing an orc chief in the allotted time. At the bottom of the mountain where Song Yan appeared, there was an entire camp of orcs. Their number was quite large. He decided to hide in the bushes and contemplate his still incipient plan of action. He is tormented by doubts about his strength, can he defeat them all? Eventually, he concludes, form a group. However, the idea crumbles into ashes. As there is no such possibility, he must cope alone. But a new idea has replaced the old one. Torches. For this, the guy collected enough logs and was able to put them in his inventory, which is a great advantage, because there is no need to spend points for this, which means more chances to save money. The only salvation and weapon against this whole horde of huge but superior pigs is fire. Some Yun is hiding behind a tree, watching the orc camp. The orc sentry does not stand guard all the time. Sometimes he gets distracted or leaves his post to rest and refresh himself in the village. Taking advantage of the moment, the young man threw a torch toward the camp. This flame was enough to set fire to the entire village and confuse the orcs. Now they try to put out the fire as quickly as possible, frantically running with buckets of water. After the flames consume the entire camp, you no longer have to worry about the return of the orc hunter and calmly complete the challenge. That's why you need to catch at least two orc workers, while all the orcs take turns drawing water from the nearby pond and putting out the fire. Son Yun waits for them in the bushes. He chose one of them, crept up behind him while he was filling his bucket, and stabbed him in the back with his sword. After his death, the young man absorbed the spirit and increased his skill to 9%. The smoke fit back into his chest, adding to his power. Suddenly an orc watchmaker rushed in from behind, taking the boy by surprise. He pounced, but fortunately Song Yun managed to defend himself with a shield. It absorbed his power and thereby enhanced some qualities, surprising his opponent. And now the orc watchman was already lying on the ground without a drop of life that the young man had taken. He became wary and decided not to let his guard down. Meanwhile the fire had already completely consumed the village. He headed there to finish off the others. Three workers, one sentry, and an old chief remained. They were still trying to survive, but some unit had already constructed a plan to complete the mission. He needed to carefully get past the sentry and kill his target. The orcs gasped, the guy fighting the workers with ease thanks to the sentry's absorbed spirit, leaving a path of corpses behind him. 
he gets to the sentry. Here you already have to defend yourself and do a good job. In the hands of the orc was a kind of staff, on top was an idol. The skull of a horned creature, decorated with a red ribbon with golden patterns and wool. This sentinel was the last but strongest obstacle. Song Yun plunged his sword into it, thinking that he had defeated it, but it was not that simple. The enraged orc rose with renewed strength and directed the power of his staff directly at the young man. He barely had time to defend himself, the orc triumphed. But the boy does not give up. He got the achievement of the one who withstood the flames. A one-on-one -on -one fight. Song Yun gathered all the strength and rage that had accumulated during this ordeal. The satisfied orc decided to repeat the past attack, already raising his hand with his staff for another strike. But Song Yun immediately cut it off with his sword, disarming the sentry. The man cried out in pain and rushed into the chamber. The hero followed him, but his surprise was great when he saw the sentry, fearfully protecting the orc children, trying to keep them safe. One of the children knelt before Song Yun, shedding tears and trusting at his feet. They were afraid for their family, and sure enough, the young man was struck again by the memories of that rotten day when he lost his parents. While he was distracted, the baby orc pulled out a small knife and aimed it at the boy. It was a distraction, but he immediately woke up, realizing that orcs aren't human and aren't like him at all, they don't have those feelings, and killed the orc child. The others immediately pounced, but now Song Yun had no doubts whatsoever. He would exterminate each and every one. That was his mission. The boy won again. The shield that had made Song Yun defend himself more than once was now in no condition at all. The number of people who came to the tower was getting smaller and smaller, and it was terrifying. The boy opened the community, and what was his surprise when one of the members informed him that he knew a way to return to Earth? He sent an email with this question. Song Yun went to the information section. His hope was as great as his desire to finally leave this place and finally become a strong hunter by going back. Meanwhile, the community chat room had become a collection of all the key information, answers to the questions they asked. The young man collected everything he learned from others, partly sharing facts as well. It turned out that once he overcame the fifth floor of the test tower, it would be possible to go back to Earth for a couple of days. However, if you pass the 8th floor, there will be a massive change in the system itself, allowing you to acquire an item with which to make the dream of returning home a reality. At this point, Song Yun had many abilities in his unique characteristic. His desire to take advantage of it and become a hunter only strengthened with each passing day, for such opportunities on Earth are already called the jackpot. He was well aware that he could show how strong he was to the detriment of all offenders. However, it should not be forgotten that he is only on the second floor. And in order to get to the goal to try hard, to make all possible efforts, to apply the previously acquired knowledge, as well as skillfully use their own unique characteristics. But there are positive aspects. Stats as somehow increase to the statistical average, which cannot but rejoice. He's gotten stronger. As he threw off the jacket, worn by trials, orcs, golems, and hard battles, the boy absorbed the remaining spirits of those creatures, he had killed in the second trial. Suddenly he felt a rush of strength literally overwhelming him from within and ready to burst forth. He, jubilant and proud of the abilities he had previously only read about in books, pushed off the walls with dexterity, ran at breakneck speed, but failed to slow down in time and crashed into the wall, leaving a dent and falling awkwardly to the floor. Lying on the floor, Sung Jun opened a store where he immediately bought a new shield that was much stronger than the old one the dead giant's shield. Without thinking too much, he bought an assassin's sword and cloak. It made him look much stronger and tittier, and naturally it added power and skill to his unique characteristic. However, that too requires sacrifice. Such equipment is not an easy thing to get used to, and as soon as possible, since there is not much time before the new test. The enthusiastic fighter began his training and was confident in his abilities fully entitled to consider himself worthy of the title of the strongest, whom no one can defeat. And so, some time later, Song Yun was already on the third floor of the test tower, again with high difficulty. The theme was a duel, but with whom? The young man was a little surprised and even excited. The anticipation languished and made him doubt himself even more. For now he is all alone in a dark cave from which there is no escape without completing the challenge. Once again the ten seconds are piled up, at the end of which the Dark Guardian, our fighter's new adversary, will appear. He needs to keep an eye on the area, so as not to miss the attack and have time to fight back. Who would have thought it was his own shadow? 
Fighting himself is not an easy task. Sungjin has already been wounded by it. He has to find another way out of the difficult task. No, it's much harder than the past ones. A noble battle ensues. Song Yun and his doppelganger the Shadow await further attack from either of them, standing at a safe distance from each other. The Shadow looks rather creepy. Red eyes that glow brightly in the darkness, a large number of sharp fangs and a serpent's tongue. Thanks to the accelerated regeneration he received in past trials, Song Yun regenerates quickly, his wound healed. Had he not been nimble enough, his opponent could have broken his spine in a heartbeat. Since the Dark Guardian is his double, he repeats the poses as well as any movements of the guy. This is quite annoying. The young man aims to destroy his pathetic impersonation. He attacks the creature first, so quickly that it doesn't have time to react, and turns back in a rage, bleeding from the wound that Sun Yum inflicted on it. Naturally, the shadow has the same unique characteristics, including recovery. The enraged guardian lunges at the boy, but fortunately does not injure him. The fighter skillfully dodges his own moves, which allows him to anticipate his opponent's actions. In such a case, he decides that it will be enough to use his own weaknesses and swordsmanship to win. They both attack and defend. The guy runs into his opponent's sword and immediately dodges, unfortunately, not deftly enough and getting cut right across the neck. The creature swiftly grows more powerful in a short period of time. Song Yun assumes a posture of readiness, greeting the Dark Guardian with a stern rage and hate-filled, murderous stare. He has activated the exclusive effect of the assassin's cloak and increased his speed by 15%. Time begins to press, for the longer the fight lasts, the harder it will be to defeat this creature. I have to come up with a plan and get rid of it as soon as possible. Only 59 seconds left. Sun Yun slips back and rushes toward the shadows again. He almost gets another fatal blow from his opponent, ducking under it and dodging again, cutting the creature's shoulder at the same time. The poor guy forgets it's his copy and finds himself without an arm, screaming in frantic pain. The sword remains in his severed and flung aside hand. The guardian does not move, for regeneration though accelerated takes time. The wound is serious. It is a chance to win. But it won't be easy enough without the sword. Eleven cursed seconds remain. Without one arm, gathering the last of his strength, the lad again rushes at the creature with only one shield. It retaliates to the sword. But thanks to Song Yun's tremendous speed and the strength of his shield, it flies away, shattering. He doesn't die, but the fighter leaps up to him again, kicking into the ground, stripping him of his head. Song Yun is victorious once again. He moves to the waiting room on the fourth floor and is once again healed of all debuffs and injuries. His hand back in place, the young man tries his strength, destroying the wall with a single fist and making sure it is intact, albeit in a rather foolish way. The fighter has also acquired the spirit of himself, the opponent of the third test, that is, the shadow. The spirit is so dense that it cannot be compared to previously defeated monsters. Now the mastery of Song Yun's unique characteristic, necromancy, has reached 100%. It has increased by one level. He also gained the following. The ability to absorb the souls of the dead and control them at will. To continually increase his stats. To leave the soul in storage and use it when appropriate. But most importantly, when absorbing the spirit of the deceased, there is a chance that one of the skills imprinted in the soul can be acquired. Song Yun realized that skills are acquired after you risk death, not at the snap of your fingers. This is not the first time the guy has been in the waiting room and feels at home. He re-enters the chat room after discovering new information about the upcoming challenge. One of the fighters sent in a question about the topic of the next challenge and learned that it would be in the form of a competition. Han Song Yun was discouraged. What do you mean, a competition? Do we really have to kill each other? The selection of applicants for the fourth challenge is complete. Concerns about killing each other are not justified, as the goal is to destroy the Goblin King within the allotted time, 24 hours. However, there is a harsh condition. The killing of all fighters or the expiration of time. Finally, the long-awaited meeting with the rest of the fighters. This is quite awkward, because up to this point the young man has only met enemies' monsters. Now he would have to triumph with his allies and find common ground with them. One of them was a cute girl named Lee Hae Young, who offered to introduce herself first. She mainly develops in team support and on the ground is already an E-Rang hunter. She looks kind, with two ponytails. The second ally is a sullen and gruff man, Lee Sung Hoon, who specializes in melee combat. He is also a D-Rank hunter. Sung Hoon immediately made a negative impression on Sung Yoon. Finally, our fighter also decided to introduce himself. 
He honestly stated that he wasn't a hunter yet and was developing in close combat, to which he received a sneer from Song Hoon. He threatened to kill the guy if he thought he was useless. Fortunately, Sung Hoon was used to this kind of attitude on the ground, but he had already forgotten such a thing. The brute was annoying to Song Yoon, and he was determined to rub his nose in it by showing off his newly acquired skills. After all, they were the ones who decided everything in the test tower. The allies are near the gate to the goblin castle, the citadel. You must complete the test before the other team and defeat the goblins, then kill their king. The gate opens and Song Hoon is immediately attacked by several goblins. He immediately snapped at Song Hoon again, causing more self-loathing. The young has already used her spell to help the team and rushes them. The man starts to arise and root again, demanding that the girl assign a new buff, but she's already used her power. He, for his part, continues only to defend himself against the goblins. Song Yoon warned the girl that he intended to help Sung Hoon get rid of the enemies that had come. She tried to stop him, saying that then no one would defend her from the rear. But it didn't work. The young man had already rushed in to attack. The boy killed the first ones with his power, after which new enemies appeared. One of the goblins knocked the weapon out of Song Hoon's hands with a bat, attacking him. But Sung Hoon defended his ally, surprising him with his skills. He took advantage of the moment and snickered, repeating the man's phrase, telling him to get out of the way and stay out of the way. With agility, the guy destroyed a batch of advancing goblins, gaining a new achievement, Goblin Hunter. Sung Hoon was literally taken aback and watched Sung Hoon's fight with his eyes bulging. Sung Yoon, killing goblins one by one, consumes their souls, becoming even stronger than before. But fortunately, the allies do not see this, as the haze remains invisible to their eyes so Song Yoon can safely absorb them as much as he wants. Unexpectedly for him, one of the goblin's skills was absorbed. He was extremely surprised and grateful. The boy got an extension of his range of vision and could now be much stronger, as he would see the goblins approaching and react more quickly than before. He was pleased with himself and smiled snidely. His vision had increased many times over. Song Hoon continued to show his rotten temper, even though Song Hoon had saved him. He devalued the guy's hard work, calling it mere luck. Still, however, he praised it, but caught the leering glances of his partners. Some Jum said he would be in charge of the operation, because the plan would clearly do the team more good than the narcissistic man. Surprisingly, some Hoon was slightly ashamed and didn't object. The guy started handing out instructions. The man was instructed to protect a young, her to provide support and report on the situation as before, something she's good at. Sung Yoon absorbed all the goblin souls and increased his skills. Meanwhile, the boys had only 14 hours left. They should hurry. They set out in search of the goblin king. Song Yun noticed the oddity that the goblins suddenly quieted down and stopped attacking. Afterwards, near the fountain, he found the goblins already dead and realized that the other team had been here before them, even earlier. They were wondering why this had happened. They didn't understand how the others had managed so quickly. The boy took a finger sample of the blood of one of the goblins. It had not yet had time to solidify, which meant that the boys could still catch up with the competition and win. They had to do it by all means, or the three of them would die, having suffered this punishment, and not completing the test first. Meanwhile, the other team continued to fight the goblins. To be more precise, only one man, the superior of the other two, was doing it. He deftly handled the crowd, looking forward to the boss fight. Finally, having finished his simple task, he hurried to the king's gates. They were as large as the previous ones, with an eye emitting a purple light in the middle. One of the team members opened them. They went inside and opened a new location. The tower's voice sounded, informing them that they would not be able to leave the location until they had finished their battle with the king. The battle would not begin until only one team was left alive. The space was covered by a transparent cube of fire, limiting the space. There was a meeting between the two teams. Of course, both were not happy with each other and wanted to end the ordeal as quickly as possible. Song Yun decided to fight alone, relying on the help of his allies. He asked Lee Hae Young to give him a dexterity buff and award the rest to Sung Hoon. But Hae Young objected, reminding him that humans were many times scarier than some creatures, and it wouldn't be easy. He'd need more buffs and hunters at his side. The boy still refused, but gave permission to help in case he found himself in danger. The young man was confident enough in his abilities for he had defeated many goblins and surely exceeded the status of the average hunter. You must defeat these three men. The second team prepared for battle. Song Yun rushed straight toward them. 
Sung Yoon and the leader of the other team rushed into the attack against each other, cutting through the dust. The leader did not expect to meet such a strong opponent and decided to defend himself with the help of his ally and his shield. The shield was powerful enough to create a protective barrier. However, Song Yun had no trouble breaking it down with his sword with ease. The enemy team flew back from the force of the blow. Song Yun rushed forward, deftly, and with the same tremendous speed, attacking and bleeding his enemies. To say that the young man surprised everyone is nothing to say. He continues to fight, albeit very slightly inferior to the leader's skills, reflecting attacks and inflicting, in turn, his own. The enemy tries to calculate his abilities and notices that Sung Yun has the ability to see the trail of weapons aimed and threatening him. He dodges the attack, but Sung Yun throws his shield at him, taking advantage of the leader's weakness of a small field of vision. As he fights off the shield in shock, the lad thrusts his sword at him. The voice of the tower announced that bonuses would be awarded after the fourth floor was passed for killing a player. Song Yun's team, including himself, stared at the enemy he had destroyed, then at him, convulsively holding his sword drenched in blood. A young notices the abnormality and worries about him, wondering about his condition, to which he replies that he is perfectly fine, though he doesn't look it. She guesses that this is the first time Sung Yun has killed a man and that he's not at all well, even though he seemed to be in a strong frame of mind. But the guy decides to defuse the situation and offers to head to the end of the challenge, a battle with the Goblin King. The team agrees. Sung Yun is already on the back of the boss and finishes him off, mercilessly inflicting wounds with his sword and striking him with his shield. He kills again, however, already a monster, which has become rather commonplace after so many trials. The Goblin King is destroyed. The fourth floor of the tower is passed. As a reward, the fighter received a new skill, instant acceleration, bonuses as well as increased his stats. Slightly shocked by Song Yun's power, Song Hoon decides to leave for the waiting room first and bids farewell to his team. Ha Young and Song Yun are left alone. The guide is also about to leave this floor, but a worried girl stops him. She decides to reassure him by saying that he was just on a mission and didn't have to commit the murder of his own volition. Especially if he didn't, she would have committed it. Song Yun felt good and things eased up a bit, and he allowed himself to smile, expressing his gratitude to the girl. Lee Hae Young felt uncomfortable because it was thanks to the guy that this ordeal was passed, he had done most of the work. Because of this, she felt as if she owed him a debt of gratitude and decided to send in a friend request. She was embarrassed, but still asked Song Yun to find her upon her return to Earth. Afterwards, too, she left him. But our hero killed a man, and now he has to make a hard decision, whether to consume a man's soul or not. He didn't do it during the battle, because it would be impossible to turn back time, it is worth to think over this serious step carefully. However, the young man did make up his mind. He is willing to go in for the kill in a no-win situation, no matter how hard it may be. He set about consuming the soul of the enemy teen leader he had killed. The dead man twitched one last time and lost his soul now forever. The guy decides to move on firmly and not to miss the chance given to him by the test tower. After the absorption, the boy enters the waiting room of the fifth floor. The voice of the tower spoke again. This time it divulged news of the expansion of the system that Song Yun had waited so long for. A system for ranking applicants has been created, titled Summing Up the Trials. A window popped up inviting him to enter his nickname. Without thinking twice, Sung Jun changed it to Hunter. A ranked list of participants opened, beginning with the strongest guys. He found himself on the 16th place and was surprised, because he hadn't expected such a high ranking for him. The people in the top 50 were given the title of Pioneers. They were the ones who would be given advantages on the 8th floor of the test tower. Also, if one continues to stick to the pioneer position further, the halo skill will also be granted on the 8th floor. Han Sung Yoon can now confidently state that he has surpassed his human qualities and has become something much more. He has also obtained a returning stone which allows him to return to Earth for three days after which he will be able to return to his original location. He confirmed his decision to return. Unknown magic absorbed the fighter and brought him back to Earth. Now he actually woke up at home, in his room on his bed. He decided to take a nap to begin with, but when he smelled an unpleasant odor emanating from himself, he changed his mind and headed for the shower. Next to the bed he found the items he had received in the test tower, and was quite happy about it. He needed to sell them as quickly as possible, because many people would soon return to Earth with their items as well, which meant that the prices on the market for detailed items would drop drastically. 
Unfortunately, only the hunters themselves can sell anything in the hunter's market. Son Yun decided to call his instructor at the hunter training center. He picked up the phone, but immediately reminded him again that he could return the money online. However, the young man refused and was confident in his decision. But in return, he asked the tutor for help with his exams. However, his last certification didn't go well, and because of that he was not allowed to take the exam. Sung Jun resorted to tricks and blackmail. He said that he never needed the money and that he could change his mind at any moment. The boy offered a deal. His mentor would let him take the exam, and he in turn wouldn't take the money. Finally, Song Yun takes a shower. He is quite pleased with the result of his efforts and with the resultant rather perfect body. However, there's no time to admire himself, he has to act. Afterwards, the young man gets ready to take his exams. He got dressed and left the apartment, meeting his neighbor in the entryway. He missed everyday life and was glad to meet even his neighbors. He said hello to her. The neighbor recognized him and mentally remembered him as a failed cadet, but she greeted him too. The contented young man wished her a good day, which embarrassed her. She noticed the changes in his body, for the guy wasn't that tall before. Now Song Yun was standing at the side of the road trying to hail a cab. As if that wasn't bad enough, not one of them shows any inclination to stop. He decides it's no big deal and takes off running to the big site in the direction of the training center. Given his strength and skills, it's really spitting. Bouncing off the rooftops of houses, he moves deftly toward his destination. After a while, he reaches the right building. Here he goes inside. He is greeted by the instructor, Wang Man Ho. He was quite surprised by the physique of his former student, because it's only been a short time, only about a week. The guy agrees, reporting that he has had to endure a lot of hardship. Their dispersal is interrupted by a man, a guy the examiner, named Kim in -hoo. He invites the boy to follow him into the exam room. The three of them went inside. But strangely enough, the callousness of Wang Man Ho's character didn't go anywhere. He asks Kim in Hu to choose the strongest monsters for Sun Yun to expel him as quickly as possible. The examiner asks the young man to choose the difficulty of the upcoming exam from 1 to 10. He used to choose the easiest one, 1, but managed to lose even to a small goblin. He was weak. Now, however, he has changed and is stronger than the average person. Once again, the instructor quips, answering that he should pick the easiest one, as he always does. But Sun Yun immediately interrupts him, voicing his choice, the tenth degree of difficulty. They looked at each other with crossed glances and waited for the start. The exam began. The enemy was a firebird. Not to forget the difficulty chosen, it slowed the young man's movement by as much as 25%. On top of that, the vicious instructor ruined the guy's sword before the exam. But there's a reason he became such a rotten person, isn't there? True. In the past, when he passed the exam became a hunter, he thought he was the best. But later the gap with his peers began to widen. They surpassed him in skill and ability. Still, after diligent but unsuccessful efforts, he stopped trying to catch up with his classmates. After all, the world of hunters is based on innate talent. If you are not destined to be a hunter, you will not become a hunter, no matter how much effort you put into it. Manu stopped trying when he felt an insurmountable wall in front of him. As a result, he is now trying to take Song Yun down, so that he will suffer his fate and not achieve his goal. He didn't want to see a weakling in himself and took it out on his student. The young man's sword cracks and breaks in two after the first contact with the bird. He bounces back. The lad, guessing what's wrong, casts a hateful glance at his mentor. He smiles back smirkily. His eyes sparkle with anticipation of victory, watching with pleasure Sun Nun's gathering momentum for his downfall. Meanwhile, the bird will not let up in the man's a fight. Against the odds, the fighter is even glad, because Nami can show his skills to the fullest. To pass the most difficult exam without weapons, he activates one of them, instantaneous acceleration. Jumping to the height of the ceiling and destroying part of it, the guy found himself near the firebird, from which the latter dodged confusedly. He plunged his broken sword right into its eye, whereupon it howled in pain. With the same rumbling sound Song Yun landed on the floor, trying to solve the problem of the short sword. Its length wasn't long enough to kill an opponent. Taking a shard of tile, the boy hurled it at the bird and sliced its head in two exactly in the middle. The fragment flew toward the observing instructor and examiner, fracturing the security railing. The exam was over. Song Yun was victorious. Ironically, the guy wondered if Man Ho and Min Hu were okay. He was completely pleased with himself and smiled smugly at them. The girl handed Song Yun his certificate confirming that he had become a hunter 
and congratulated him on successfully passing the exam. She said that now, after registering with the Hunters Association, he could officially conduct hunting activities, namely, entering the dungeon and selling items. Meanwhile, the instructor and the examiner were in the lounge having a mug of coffee. Man Ho was furious. He was swearing at the examiner. Because Song Yun wasn't supposed to pass the exam, he was supposed to be expelled from the Hunters Association. Kim in hu excused himself, saying that he had done everything he could. He was guided by the information given to him about the Kated, and according to them, there was no way he should have passed the exam. After all, no one knew how strong the boy had become. But the instructor is still reluctant, thinking that a lower rank could have been given to the guy. The examiner reminds him again that he chose the high difficulty and won in a matter of 10 seconds. No lower grade is possible. Besides, in that case, the former cadet could have filed a complaint. Song Yun walked in on them, telling them that he had received his ID. And Hu Fake congratulated him. Continuing to play it off, the boy walked over to his mentor, remarking aloud that he didn't look well. But Man Ho brushed it off, barely squeezing out his congratulations. The young man also recalled that before he retired, the instructor was rank C. And fleetingly, the memory of calling Song Yun a brat crept back to him. But now he could well claim that it was Man Ho who was the scum here. The enraged instructor lashed out at Song Yun. The boy provoked him on purpose. He immediately dodged the fist aimed in coming toward him, punching Man Ho in the stomach properly and slapping him in the face afterwards. He justified himself by simply defending himself in response to the aggression. After what happened, Sung Yoon left the building where Kim in hu was waiting for him. He was offered a partnership with the Hunters Association. He was offered a rather large salary of 1 billion won. The man added that he supposedly could see the young man's potential. Sung Yoon was not confused and reminded them that it seemed that the level of difficulty of the exam had been adjusted quite arbitrarily. After the argument about Kim in hus lack of credibility, he went home and threw away his business card. Two days later, the latest news about the existence of the mysterious so-called test tower was being widely circulated. In the meantime, the young man had already received enough money in exchange for his weapon. One could conclude that the three days on Earth had not been wasted and were quite productive. The familiar voice of the tower sounded. In a few seconds, Song Yun would again be transported to the waiting room of the test tower. The boy woke up in the bed of the waiting room. As it turned out, items could be safely moved from the ground to the test tower and vice versa. He put them in his inventory. The young man decided to stretch himself and without delay to begin the fifth test. Suddenly he was assigned a new skill, the Eye of Truth. Now he could use his mana to learn true information about any target he was watching. Plus he could now tell the difference between his opponent's lies and the truth. Song Jun acquired a thunder sword as well as a scout hunter's shield. Though the sword cost a lot of money, the price was justified by its option to use the lightning effect when hitting the enemy. The young man set out determinedly for his next challenge. Entry to the fifth floor of the test tower is made. The difficulty is high. The theme becomes the hunt for the werewolf boss in the wolf ravine. Time to complete no more than 24 hours. The penalty for failure is death or the expiration of the allotted time. The reward for victory is a werewolf headband. Songin landed in front of a high canyon that looked like a mountain. A pack of werewolves had already awaited him at the base. At once they came upon him, ready to devour him. So he sped up and knocked them back a short distance, wounding most of them. As always, our hero skillfully repulsed the attacks of his enemies, ruthlessly depriving them of their already short life. The boy was a little surprised by their weakness. He fought off another wolf that flew right into the clutches of a stronger opponent. These creatures were covered in white fur and endowed with the most powerful build. They were about ten times the size of their previous enemies. Son Yun was now surrounded by giants. They rushed to kill the fighter. However, he did not lose confidence and continued to fight back. The boy noticed something strange in front of him. Now he was even having fun going through the trials. They gave him a share of pleasure. The thought that he was going mad flashed through his mind. The wounded giants fell to the ground dead weight one by one. Thanks to defeating such a powerful opponent, Song Yun gradually improves his skills and weaponry proficiency. The hunter's dagger skill has almost reached its limit. The guy needs to get a new swordsmanship skill. He was so confident that he was ready to fight and kill critters without stopping. After a while, the young man would absorb the souls of the mad wolves again and increase his skill. If Song Yun could do his best today, he would raise the rank of a unique characteristic. He reached the middle of the ravine 
but the boss was still nowhere to be seen. The fighter noticed something amiss. He walked between a whole dead pack of wolves. But who could have killed them if he was all alone in this ordeal? There was no warning from the tower that anyone else would be here. Perhaps there was a conflict in the pack. However, it was obvious that the wolves had been killed by someone else's hands, namely a sword. The cut was too flat, and there were blade marks on the walls of the ravine. Sonyan decided to use his newly acquired skill, the Eye of Truth. The information said that it was a trace from a very skilled D-rank aura. The fighter was in doubt. He didn't know anything about what he had heard. Afterwards, he heard someone scream and rushed straight to the source of the sound. A roar was heard from the depths. From there it came the werewolf boss that Song Yun was supposed to defeat. The young man was frightened, who had committed the murder before him. Does death await him now? The system tries to find out why and soon completes its analysis. It turns out that his trial was invaded by a challenger from another dimension. The system changed the purpose of the test to kill the intruder. Song Yun began to speculate that perhaps the test tower did not only exist on Earth, but also in other dimensions. In front of the young man was a big man, fully equipped in armor with a long sword. The unknown man was astonished at the man's survivability. He asked the boy questions, but he did not answer. He was probably lost in thought. The mutant had behaved quite unacceptably and naturally did not see the man as a threat and was ready to destroy him at once. However, Song Yun defended himself with his sword. The boy would never have thought that the target of his own ordeal could be destroyed by someone else. Nevertheless, he was still lucky that the test was not complete and he had not, so far, been defeated. The giant continued to mock and aimed to interrupt the suffering of the young man. He pounces as hard as he can. The guy kicks the boss he killed in the new enemy, but he reacts quickly, sweeping away the obstacle on the move. Song Yun takes advantage of his opponent's distracted attention and slips to the other side, attacking from the back. Suddenly the guy's sword bumps into the armor, but doesn't break it, which he clearly didn't expect. The boy tries to defend himself from the aura directed at him with his remaining shield, but it crashes. Some Jun flies backwards. The poor guy slams into the wall, coughing up blood. Blood trickled down her arm. Song Yun dropped to the ground with one knee, showing weakness. The intruder continued to press on, saying that the guy could have just succumbed and died painlessly, rather than blocking such a strong aura. Finally, the fighter couldn't stand it and shouted that he didn't understand what was happening at all and demanded an explanation since he was on the verge of death anyway. The enemy reported what he called a floor infiltration. The test tower is a rather unpredictable place and it just so happens that our hero was unlucky enough to meet an intruder in his test. However, the enemy is not going to give in. On the contrary, he intends to end it quickly and kill the man. Sum Yun stops him still begging him to tell him about a peculiarity unknown to him. He reluctantly agrees, fully confident that he will kill the boy without much effort and that he poses no threat or danger to the man. After informing him that there is a change in the tower system on the eighth floor, a floor introduction ticket is added to the option, which can be purchased by the player for points. After purchasing it, the fighter can interfere in some other challenge of any floor person. Some Yun then asked if the intruder really came from another dimension. Afterwards, he used the Eye of Truth, but forgot that his opponent understood his actions and was notified of the detailed skill. The latter was quite offended by this attitude and pointed his sword at the young man again, irritated that the lad was managing to defy him. He, on the other hand, had not lost his strength thanks to his pain-tolerance skill, and his broken arm did not make him uncomfortable. He continued to surprise the giant by demonstrating an accelerated regeneration skill, after which the young man's arm immediately healed. Song Yun held it up on purpose to make it look pitiful and thereby draw out the necessary information. The intruder still has no doubts about himself and is determined to win. For his part, Song Yun boosts his stats with the absorbed souls of the slain werewolves and has no intention of giving up either, thus shocking the enemy even more. He activates the instant acceleration and heads towards the giant with an arrow. The fight begins. The intruder did not expect that the man from the fifth floor would be so strong and even have a unique characteristic with him, intending to defeat him, the warrior from the eighth floor. He then activates his aura again, but Sung Jun bounces back out of the way and crashes his sword into the canyon's edge. The enraged mutant cuts him in half, tossing the guy aside. He analyzes the situation, identifying his opponent's strengths. It turns out that his main advantage is his armor. The young man, unfortunately, cannot destroy it with his currently available abilities but as he continues to strike one blow after another, 
he manifests the effect of his thundering sword, causing lightning to form in the aftermath, adding to the damage. The enemy is trapped by the lightning, resenting and gradually losing strength as he cannot fight with such power. Soon the power of the lightning stops and drops the intruder. Sung Yoon approaches the lying, bloodied enemy, making sure that his armor cannot reflect the lightning. He tries to gather his strength and stand up, but the heavy armor does not allow him to do so with a body so weakened by the current. However, the big man's ability to speak is not lost, starting to become even more indignant, because judging by his level, he should have won, not some kid from the fifth floor. How does a kid have so many skills anyway? Song Yun immediately contradicted him, adding that he shouldn't have relied only on his status and armor. That might well not be enough. He had done a rash and risky thing without making sure that he was 100% able to defeat an unknown enemy. Now, it was time for the beloved thug to meet death face to face. Sung Jun tried to use Sung Jun's trick of distraction, ostensibly to provide more information. But Sung Yun was not taken in by the intruder, so he killed him in the process. Once again, he kills another fighter. Each time, however, it gets easier. After all, it's every man for himself in this game. Plus, it only goes to his advantage. After all, if a young man felt disgusted or uncomfortable after every kill, or worse, in front of him, it would bring a lot more trouble to pass the test. Here Song Yun passed the fifth floor of the test tower as well. With uncertainty, the fighter devoured the soul of the challenger, whose name was Kadidrax, then raised his skills again. If the lad had been slow, he might well not have had time to absorb the soul of such a strong challenger. The voice of the tower notifies him that the difficulty of the challenge passed and the reward do not match. The component of the reward is completely changed to receiving the skill three absolutes. Song Yun also received the following already bonus rewards, 7,500 points, 3,500 bonus points. Most importantly, instead of a C rank, our fighter earned an A rank. The young man was pleasantly surprised by such generosity of the system and his abilities. Moved to the waiting room of the sixth floor, Sung Yun is healed of all his injuries. Sitting down on the floor, he began to think about everything that was going on. But of course, he didn't have all his questions answered, and though he wanted to keep the question tickets until the eighth floor, he decided to use them now. He sent out a request for more information on what a floor introduction was, and also a question. Can you find out about the introduction of another applicant to your trial in advance? Unexpectedly, he quickly got an answer. It turned out that besides the fact that this option is only available after reaching the 8th floor, infiltration is only possible with a gap not exceeding the number of 10 floors and only in individual trials. Son Yun immediately wondered if the staircase of the climber was cut off after being killed. However, the system did not provide the information as it was currently unavailable. As a consequence, the ticket was not used. Sung Jun opened his inventory, retrieving the items he had brought with him from his last visit to Earth. Using the Croak and Magic Tower's recovery chest, the young man repaired his broken shield. The boy also acquired a Stone of Purity, which replaces one trip to the showers. While a foolhardy purchase, it is still worth the cost, as bathing leaves him feeling refreshed and invigorated. The next challenge is one hour and twelve minutes away. There was still plenty of time, so Song Yun decided to look at the rating board. He found himself in third place. He found it hard to believe, but that was really it. Afterwards, he entered the chat room, where there was total confusion. Contenders started selling ways to gain certain skills. One of those was the mental resistance skill. Although it helps reduce the spiritual shock of being killed, it doesn't eradicate the problem itself. That is why it is quite useless. It is much better to overcome this fear on your own, despite the fact that you will have to sacrifice the lives of pretenders. A pretender has been discovered who has spoiled the atmosphere of the fourth floor. He has deliberately set everyone up to fight and antagonize each other. His nickname is Judy Gongyu. Perhaps Song Yun should remember this person. The portal to the sixth floor trial opened. The theme was occupation. The execution time is 50 minutes. The goal is to capture one of the strongholds in any direction. The penalty for losing is death or expiration of the allotted time. The reward is a random chest. Sung Jun finds himself in an endless expanse of sea, on the surface of which there are strongholds connected by long paths tracks. The selection of contenders was over, but Song Yun's team still had no more men. Suddenly a sword appeared from the portal, from which the boy successfully dodged, pulling his ally along with him. This was no accident. The challenger was actually determined to kill the fighter. 
Turns out, everyone had long been determined to kill even their own teammates in order to gain as much skill as possible. Song Yun started to object, but the challenger only took his words as hypocrisy. The joint players began to attack each other. But there were some reasonable people, too bad they weren't on Song Yun's team. They decided to make a really good decision and join forces, seemingly disgusted with the other crazies. But no, this is another distraction. One of the participants kills the other. While our fighter is defiantly distracted by this scene, his ally points his sword at him again. Thanks to his field of vision, Sun Yu noticed this and managed to react in time to kill him. The young man decided to do the wiser thing than the others. He would not kill on purpose, but merely defend himself as the others attacked. One of the fighters present decided to defend his stronghold with an iron dome formed by water. He studied water magic and supposedly became a water wizard, thinking that he had the most important advantage, which would definitely help him to quickly complete the test. However, he is approached at high speed by Song Yun. Dissecting the water and loosening the track, he takes a high leap and pushes himself off the dome. He didn't expect such force at all, but was content to let the fellow fail to penetrate it the first time. Except that the fighter had a slightly different plan. He got to the top of the dome and smashed it, kicking the challenger water wizard in the face with all his acceleration. He immediately blacked out and collapsed, unable to hold the defense any longer causing the dome to disappear. Though the young man's actions were quite brutal on the contestant, it was worth it, because he frightened the others with his power, after which they decided not to take the risk, to retreat and not try to capture this point, taking other paths to other strongholds. Sun Yun captured the stronghold. However, it is worth being on the lookout, as the capture will immediately be interrupted if there is another participant in his territory. The remaining time in which to defend the stronghold is 10 minutes. Most of the people on this test are mostly low-ranked, since not everyone returned to Earth using the ticket but went straight on and are probably now well beyond the sixth floor of the test tower. Here each one does not trust the other. There is no trust of any kind, much less teamwork, which is now out of the question. Everyone needs skills and they are undeniably willing to go out of their way to kill an innocent. Everyone is determined to kill each other. Although the guy was able to alert the opponents to scare them away from their stronghold, that doesn't mean that no one will get hurt, because in any case, you'll have to at least kill someone who tries to seize the point and interfere. Suddenly the capture came to a halt. A group of challengers, consisting of four men, entered the point. One of them was again an arrogant kid. He tried to snicker and reproach the guy for not knowing what was going on and why there were twice as many of them. But Song Yun immediately replied that he already knew what was going on. Usually a team consists of two people but here, there's a whole squad of assassins. They group together to gain more skills and easily defeat each lone man. Afterwards, the two extremes pounced on the guy. He was already ready to repel the attack, but, as luck would have it, one of the opponents used the merging of heart skill. After that, the young man would share the pain with the challenger if he inflicted wounds on him. He deliberately struck his hand so that Song Yun would be left unarmed, feeling a great deal of pain but he is saved by the pain tolerance skill, which partially reduces the pain shock. At this point, one of the fighters scooped up seawater in his shield and poured it on the guy. This did him a lot of damage because, as it turns out, coming in contact with seawater on the sixth floor test penalizes the player. His strength is significantly reduced. He gets weaker for three seemingly insignificant, but at the same time excruciating, minutes. But our hero doesn't give up because he is much stronger than a group of narcissistic bastards, and his eyes burns excitement. His opponent was aiming for Song Yun, ready to finish him off any minute now. Han Song Yun admitted that their tactic of stripping his opponent of his weapons and weakening his stats was quite good, because an ordinary player would very likely not have been able to survive. But not our young man. He pushed his attacker back with his hand in the face, smashing him to the point and nearly smashing him through. Blood splattered all over the surface. The opponents had not expected such an outcome. Meanwhile, Song Yun had gained a new skill, the pity of the weak. Its effect was that if the opponent did not surpass any of the fighter's characteristics, the strength increased in accordance with the difference in characteristics. An enraged member of the assassination team attacked the guy from behind. But this was where the skill he had just acquired came in handy. It was weaker than Song Yun, which helped activate it. The young man jumped twice the challenger's height, hitting him in the face with his knee in the flight, then kicked him to the ground. 
The two remaining members of the team were perplexed and trying to find a way out. The one who first spoke to Song Yun when they met chopped off the lay of the other, who shared the pain with the young man. Naturally, the boy was weakened enough in the aftermath. This pain, though it did not cause any real damage, prevented him from fully using his strength. The injured man tried to get up, but he was crippled again. Yun's sleep was severely weakened, so the only way out was to kill whoever shared the pain with him and stop the effect of the merging heart skill. Thankfully, his pain tolerance allows him to at least move around. The fighter threw his shield at him. However, no one said he would not feel this strong wave of pain. The first opponent decided not to waste time and took his chance, pointing his sword at Song Yun. But the young man had enough strength to stop the blade and eventually break the sword. With a splinter, he slit the challenger's throat. Time ran out. The fighter survived. Only those who were prudent and rallied as a team won and all because of someone who set people up for murder. However, this Song Yun now looked like a reflection of that person in the eyes of the other challengers. Many watched his strength and the way he mercilessly killed others. Still, the boy has completed the sixth floor test of the tower. As a reward, he receives a random draw box and 8,000 points. There is a return to the waiting room. A portal opens. Song Jun absorbs the souls of the slain challengers, and thus increases the rank of his unique characteristic necromancy by one level. He finds himself back in the waiting room, but this time on the seventh floor. He is presented with an option to view his achievements, showing the S grade he has achieved. It turns out that the challenger is rewarded with a skill points or a stat increase after receiving the achievement. Retrieving a random draw box from his inventory, the young man opened it. Suddenly a small green creature popped out, resembling a Pokemon in its small size. It was angry, but it looked cute enough. First, Sung Yoon needs to catch a Pokemon. As it turned out, it wasn't that easy. He chased the Pokemon around the room, each time letting it out of his hands because it dodged cleverly. But lo and behold, he got his chance and the guy caught it. The small but somehow evil creature bit him in the arm, thus breaking free again. Sung Yoon tried to handle it gently, but now, in earnest, he wants to catch the cute creature. He slips away again. Doing a somersault, the fighter makes a fist punch at the Pokemon. After a critical hit, it shattered into pieces. Inside was an item of the highest class that could be caught, namely Class B. The item's name is Wrought Iron Pendant. It is imbued with the soul of a blacksmith who has worked with iron all his life. It increases swordsmanship skills by 7%, and the exclusive steel defense effect is activated when mana is injected, and since mana is consumed, there is no recovery time. Suddenly, the test tower made a request for the start of the seventh test. Normally, a rest time would be given, but this time it goes differently. Going into the community, Song Yun made sure that he was not the only one who had disappeared. But that doesn't do any good for some, because as one contender shared, sometimes they spend several days preparing. In the seventh floor chat room, however, the atmosphere has returned to something adequate. People are realizing that killing for nothing is not a good idea. The next test is personal so the killers won't win anything. Going into the information section of the unique characteristic, the young man found more specific explanations. It turns out that absorbed souls can be used not only to increase the stats, but also to learn magic protection. The boy decided to take a risk and check how strong this protection is. Even if he took serious damage, the waiting room is equipped with instant healing. The acquired protection lived up to expectations. The spirit absorbed the damage inflicted, and the fighter was uninjured. However, the soul that absorbed the pain was gone. Opening the ranking board, Song Yun was convinced that he had slipped down to one place. However, that wasn't so bad and critical, as being in the top 50 was enough to be called a pioneer. The guy proceeded to the next test. The topic was proof. The allotted time was 40 minutes. He had to pass three tests. If he fails, the player is punished by death. The reward for winning is the skill Grace of the Wind of Rank A. Song Yun found himself in a long corridor lit only by wall torches. He rushes forward, but is in no hurry. The absence of anyone is sufficiently aggravating. At the end of the tunnel appeared a bright blue light, which absorbed the young man and transported him to the location of the first of the three trials. Here the player must prove that he has overcome his fears. Song Yun is located in the desert. These trials prove to be a resumption of the three already passed. In front of the fighter out of the sand again forms a golem. Now he can easily defeat it, but don't you think there's a catch? Exactly, it was three times the size of the previous one. The sand golem made a swing with his hand, but Song Yun is not afraid. He is confident and determined to win. Slipping under his arm, he rushes up it. 
after which he pushes off, reaching his head, but nothing happens. As was known from the first training test, the golem's weak point is its core. However, the fighter does not observe it now. Perhaps it is too huge and a layer of sand prevents him from reaching the so-called heart. The golem encloses the guy in a fist while he is distracted by the thought. But it doesn't last long, the guy uses the most powerful force and destroys his hand, freeing himself again. He decides to chop the enemy to pieces. With a sword he cuts his body in every possible place. But nothing changes, for it is only sand, he recovers quickly. Yoon's dream only made him furious, causing him to strike the ground with his fist, so hard that the guy flew half a kilometer away. The young man flees, dodges the blows over and over again. Ring any bells, that's right. He comes to escape when he finds the way out, just as he did in the very first challenge. The golem slams his body into the sand with tremendous force, going several meters deeper. Yoon's dream is lightly covered by a wave of sand, but he immediately rises, arming himself with his sword and activating the three absolute skill. Afterwards, he chops off the bully's arm. Contrary to the fact that the giant recovers with the sand, cutting blows must still be done, because this is the only way to find the core. The young man continues to cut through the golem's body and notices a strange thing. It shrinks in size. Most likely, this is due to the fact that the golem regenerates only due to its own component of sand and cannot take it from the environment. That is why there is a significant weight loss. Song Yun calls the sand golem cute out loud, which makes him embarrassed. But the friendly atmosphere does not last long and the fight resumes. Song Yun dissects the golem again, the golem becoming quite small. This makes it easier for him to attack the boy. For a while, the young man just plays around, easily dodging the already smaller, more nimble golem's attempts to catch him. He could have had more fun, but time is running out. There's only half an hour left for the other two challenges. The fighter sneaks up from behind and smashes the core with his sword, completing the challenging part of the challenge.